Okay, welcome everybody. Um, it's the appointed hour. Welcome to this meeting of audit and governance. I can draw your attention to the agenda. First item, apologies for absence. Just have an apology from Councillor Alder. Thank you, there's no, no substitute. Okay, thank you. Next item, item two on the agenda with the minutes. Um, we've got two sets of minutes to look at tonight. Uh, members may recall that last the last meeting, we we didn't have enough people present at that meeting who were actually present at the meeting whose minutes we were the minutes we were looking at. So the two sets of minutes we need to look at tonight are in the pack beginning on page six, and they relate to the meetings held on the nineteenth of July and the 29th of September. Uh, members happy that there are correct record of those two meetings? Oh, we didn't. I'm sorry, I've been instructed to do them separately. So the first one will be the nineteenth of July. So we've got a council Fernando opposing and. So all booth to second. Those all those in favour for the 19th of July minutes. That's in favour. Um, because I guess you were you're, you're, yeah, you're absent. Thank you. Okay. So Councillor Huggins was saying something. The next set is on the uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of September. Are we happy that we are okay. Councillor Crofton, thank you. And Councillor Huggins seconded. All those in favour? I think that's unanimous. I think Councillor Fernando is absent. So thank you. Okay, that's a minute still. But I think all the items that we need to talk about the meeting are on the agenda. So I think we can move on. If members are happy to to item three, um, chairman's announcements. The only announcement I've got is the usual one of reminding members to use the microphones when they're speaking. So the, this meeting has been webcast, but I don't think there are any, anything else I need to say. Smashing. So item four, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest that might have been called? No, okay. Well, if, if anything comes up during the course of the meeting, do you, if we can just draw my attention to it, that's great. That brings us to item five, and that's section 106 update, uh, beginning on the papers related to this, beginning on page 39. And Jackie, welcome to the meeting. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is the third annual report to audit governance on my section 106 update. I apologise to members who've been to my two previous member briefings and to the town and country or the town and parish council planning forum briefings because it's you're going to get a third dose of section 106. Um, basically it's a full and detailed report on the work that I do on section 106. Now first of all it covers appendix A which is the infrastructure funding statement. Um, we have to produce this to conform with the to 2019 SIL legislation. And once it's actually gone through this committee, I can then actually put it, publish it on our council website and submit it to central government. And then we are in line with legislation requirements. The infrastructure funding statement is a standard document. It covers um, the last financial year, which is 21-22. And it gives information on the new section 106 agreements signed in that year. Um, with detailed information on the numbers of affordable housing within those uh, agreements, monitoring fees, a detailed breakdown of the contributions that are held and allocated, um, information on the developments with contributions that were actually triggered for payment in that year, and a breakdown of those individual contributions. Then I've included a section on the how the contributions were actually used by the council. So there's new information on how East Hearts has actually used it on capital and revenue contributions. So we funded things like Grange Paddock's leisure centres, as well as revenue contributions that pay for grounds maintenance contract. I've also included a little section on the projects that we actually supported. So that's, you know, gives you some idea of other things that are actually supported, because there's things like the Gilston had a new kitchen which is very good um, and also we've supported the Bishop Stortford Rugby Club with their ongoing project for new changing rooms. There's also information in there because it is a published document on how to actually apply for section 106 funding so you know if you come across any projects or any organisations that want to know more about how to apply please point them towards our website it's on the section 106 funding page. Now, the Section 106 report itself goes into detail on how I actually work with senior planners and other organisations such as the County Council and the Integrated Care Board, used to be the CCG, 
to actually identify contributions when new developments come along that actually hit the threshold for being able to you know work with the developer to identify and work out exactly the financial contributions due to the council and the other bodies there's detailed information in the report on exactly what the contributions are, what they're required for, when they're triggered, and you know, this and this I pulled together using information from county, from the health board, and from our own website and our planning documents. So this is a you know quite a good appendix that just gives you an overview of exactly what section 106 contributions are asked for as standard as well as the more bespoke ones such as you know cemetery contributions and burial contributions it's not a standard but we have asked for it before so that gives you an information on that now i was asked specifically by members for information on how i dealt with late payments i'd like to point out that i've been in this role for three years now when i first started I did a complete review of all current and historic Section 106 agreements to find out if there were any contributions that hadn't been paid. And when I did find some, I actually charged late payment fees and compound interest. So, but the good news is I haven't had to do that since 2020 because I now have a really good working relationship with developers and they do actually pay on time now. For member information, I've also included information on how I allocate the received contributions. As members will be aware, in a Section 106 agreement, to comply with the legislation, the actual contribution has to have a named use. We, it can't just be for outdoor sports. It's got to be outdoor sports in a particular area or for a particular organisation. So I actually have written in there my actual procedure for making sure that the identified and held contributions are awarded in a fair and open way so that everyone can actually see you know how they're allocated um, i will say that if members do know of any projects sports organizations that need funding to please let me know because i'm always looking to for new ones when we get new developments come along because it's best to be forearmed and I'm getting together my wish list. So please do get in touch. Um, also, we now have a use agreement form which has actually been provided by our previous planning lawyer so that when we allocate funding to an organisation, we have a little bit of legal backup so that we can actually sue them if they misspend or misuse the contribution we have provided. So that's a little bit of backup for us. So there are some figures in here that are actually quite impressive. Um, in the last 26 years, the East Hearts have been collecting Section 106. We've actually received over 14 million pounds. Now of that, we've spent 8.8 .8 million pounds. and We currently hold 5.9 million. This sounds like a lot, but within the named uses and agreements, 5.7 of this is already allocated. This does actually leave us um, an allocated amount of £206,000, of which £108,000 is in the Standon area because it's, um, it's identified for use for children and young people in the parish of Standon. So because it hasn't actually named as particular play area, and this is some of the historic ones that I've inherited, I'm actually working with Standon Parish Council to actually identify ways to use the funding in a sustainable and fair way across the parish of Standon. So the specific information in there on the 21-22 previous financial year, um, which was, I have to say, a bumper year for Section 106. We received from 36 triggered contributions, 2.6 million. I'm rounding it here. You don't need to hear pennies. And we actually spent or allocated to 27 individual projects from 42 individual contributions, 3.4 million pounds. So 
I have to clarify that the 3.4 million does include a significant amount that we received on behalf of the Hertfordshire County Council and just we collected it and then transferred it to them. Now, there's also a little bit of information in the report on um, section 106 in the current financial year, but it only goes up to September 22. And members asked for some information on potential legislative changes. Now, as you'll be aware, in I think it was the summer of 2020, there was a white paper on planning. Now, there was some quite um, controversial things put forward in that. And there was some um, interesting consultation undertaken that went back to government. Now, they, instead of going for an individual planning bill, they've actually put the planning legislation into the levelling up and regeneration bill, which is going through Parliament at the moment. The highlights of this are that there is going, if it goes through as it is, a mandatory new infrastructure levy that we will be compelled to actually apply, which is quite a bit of detail in there. If you need to know any more, I can provide information after the meeting. But I read it as good news is that they're actually keeping Section 106 for larger developments because the government is aware that Section 106 is very good at providing bespoke contributions in local areas rather than a levy going across a bigger area. So that's the good news on Section 106. I did put some information into my report on the September 22 fiscal statement, but unfortunately, a lot of that information has now changed, and I'm pretty sure that we'll find out even more tomorrow when the budget comes forward. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. But I do apologise for having an out-of-date report, but I couldn't keep up with it. There's also a small section on how I generate income. Now, in all Section 106 agreements now, we have a monitoring fee that can actually be charged, which covers the cost of me monitoring the Section 106. In the previous three financial years, up to the end of March this year, we've achieved £26,950.81. So I also charge for Section 106 status confirmation letters, which is a letter that solicitors ask for when you move house on a new development, just to confirm that you are not, go as a householder, are not going to be um, held responsible for any outstanding Section 106 funding. And in the three years, in the previous three years, we've raised £9,731.30 and we now charge £94 for a letter. So that is a, a small but significant form of income for me monitoring Section 106. Can I just ask the, the income, does that go into the planning? Sorry. Yes. Into the planning, isn't it? Yeah, okay. all of that income actually goes into um, the actual planning budget. So, okay. Does anyone have any questions for me? That's a crop. Good evening. Fantastic report. Very uh, uh, informative, and uh, you've answered a couple of my questions already with your good briefing note. Um, on the page 50 with the um, 21-22 income and allocation. Uh, obviously, I, I, I'm making the assumption, I think you've already covered it, we spent 3.4 and uh, we got 2.6 in. So that's a drag forward from 2021, presumably, to spend that money in 21-22. In well, yes and no, in effect that um, it all goes into a bigger pot mm. and it's, it never balances out year on year. Right. Because the Section 106 agreements are signed when a planning application is decided, mm. which then means that you've potentially got a couple of years before you actually trigger the actual payment of the contributions. Mm. Because the count, I'll explain, the county council contributions are normally paid, paid on commencement of yep. the development, and we're second in line, and we are normally, our contributions are triggered for payment. First occupancy. Probably on 50% of the housing being occupied. So we always have a bit of a drag getting the funding in, and we always have a historic pot of money sitting there. Yeah. Okay. And 
Chairman, can I carry on? Um, you've done the number of offices. You, you're on a lone, lone gunner on your Section 106, aren't you? It is me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, question, please, about the uh, Section 106 applications. Do, does the money have to be allocated to project within the area where the house building has taken place? Yes, it does. It has to conform. Parish or town or what? what's the definition it, or it, village? It depends on the wording of the actual Section 106 agreement itself, because it can say within the parish of, within the or within the locality, or the named project. Um, unfortunately, you can't have Section 106 funding given to a village at one end from a town at another end of the district. It has to be within the locality. It has to, basically Section 106 funding is to offset the um, or to mitigate the de new developments. So therefore, the funding itself is to be spent for the purposes of the new residents. Um, so we we can justify spending a little bit further out if we can justify that the residents of the development are actually going to be using what the contribution is funding. Mm. But but there are sort of you know, limits within... Uh, it's interesting because uh, in um, Watford Stone, the Section 106 money for the development there, a lot of it went to Ware Library. So... Now, I can't comment on that one because uh, the library contributions are county council contributions. Yeah. And I believe that there's their contributions go into a bigger pot to fund a bigger thing because okay. the, for things like schools, it goes into the education one to provide schools that cover a bigger area than where the development is. Okay. And my final, just one, Chairman, is um, on 3.44, examples of Section 106, there's no mention of Gresley Way, which is one of the biggest developments uh, in our part of the world. There's no, it's not, you've listed all the Grange Paddocks, Harton, Castle Park, Pinehurst. No I haven't got Way. money yet. Oh, that's only of what has been received. Yeah, yeah right. that's what's okay. been received and what I've actually... I would say I, as if I'm spending it myself, what we have actually allocated the funding to. It was just to give you a heads up on okay. where the kind of contributions actually go. No. All right. Thank you. Probably Thank you. next year. <laughs> Any other questions? Second. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to ask um, about the controls for ensuring that money spent is actually delivering benefit that is um, desired locally because a lot of these applications are coming forward from their uh, town and parish councils who don't necessarily have to consult so what controls are in place to make sure it's actually uh, locally desired to deliver the projects that section 106 is um, funding can I just say, this is my ongoing mission, is to make sure that, you know, any new development that comes forward, Section 106 contributions are wanted and required by the, the local residents. I rely, because I'm covering the whole district, I rely on close working partnerships with the planning officers, with the town and parish councils, with ward members, and with local sports organisations, girl guides, bowls clubs, I try to make Section 106 as visible as possible. I've produced a Section 106 web page that has an expressions of interest form on there that I would recommend anyone who's looking for funding actually completes and it's submitted to me that basically tells me who you are, where you are, what you want to do and roughly how much you're looking for. And that gives me an idea that I can then look on the contributions that we're actually holding or if we haven't actually got anything that will fund at the moment from held contributions, it goes into my wish list of potential projects for new developments. So that then if a new development comes along in that particular area, the planners who come to me and consult with me when they receive the planning application, I can say, oh yes, I know that in that area, there is this organization, this sports body, this girl guides group that are looking for funding. And then we can actually I then can get in touch with them and say, are you still looking for funding? What would you be looking for? You know, 
and we can actually potentially write it into new Section 106 agreements. So it is an ongoing process. Unfortunately, there is only me, so any help that you can provide me with, I'll gladly take. I'd just like to point out that once we receive a contribution, we do have up to normally 10 years to actually allocate it. Now, this is from the date we receive it. It's not the date of the Section 106 agreement. So when you look in the infrastructure funding statement and you're looking at allocations of funding from sort of like 12 or 15 years ago, it's not me um, being late with allocating. It's just that they haven't been received until five years after the signing of the Section 106 agreement. Thank you. On page 41, paragraph 3.2, you mentioned that the uh, work's being done to sort of promote, promote sustainability and to sort of adopt this approach for any new um, Section 106 funding bids. Have you got any sort of examples of, of that? I know you mentioned later in the report things like trying, using it to fund solar panels and electric charging points. Are there any other sort of projects, sort of sustainable projects that you could let us to, tell us about? Well, we do. When we fund play areas, we do tend to actually ask that people look towards recycled um, surfacing and things like that, that are actually going, because Section 106 funding is not an ongoing funding stream. It is a one-off funding because it comes from a particular development. And when the funding is spent, that is it. So I always ask my people who are bidding for the funding to make sure that what they actually have is a sustainable use that it's not you know going to need replacing in two years because there is no more money after that so what actually has to go forward has to be a sustainable um project as such as with regard you know we are looking at electric vehicle charging points and i'm now working with certain village halls on solar panels On page 44, uh, sort of para 317, you talk about indexation of payments. Mm -hmm. And so it, does that apply sort of for when the, in the period between the, the I guess when the agreement's signed and then the funds are paid across, is that how, how the, the, an element of an indexation is applied to the, the amount contained in the agreement? Yes, it does. I'll explain. Um, if you look at the typical Section 106 requirements, Appendix B, you'll see that I've listed all of the actual um, standard contribution requirements in there. And I've put in, what's it, one, two, three, fourth column along, index and base date for indexation. Most of them, all of the um, indexation actually starts, we actually like to put it forward from the date of the supplementary planning document, which most of these contributions come from the Leisure and Open Spaces supplementary planning document, which was adopted in May 2020. And because there is a standard calculation spreadsheet on our webpage, on the planning policy webpage, where if you have a development and you put in the number of units in there, it will automatically calculate the contributions for you in pounds and pence, um, rather than actually, because that is set from May 2020, we now actually ask for indexation from May 2020, because otherwise, if we then start saying your agreement was signed, I don't know, October 22, you've missed a significant period of indexation. So we actually always explain to developers that the indexation is based on the planning supplementary planning document adoption date so which brings me to the contribution for bins or the refuse and recycling contribution that is in the planning obligations 2008 supplementary planning document so we always actually backdate the indexation on that one to October 2008 which you know looks like a bit of an anomaly but that is to actually you know, make sure that we get the correct amount of funding to cover the cost of providing the receptacles. And the, the level of the rate of RPI that you use, is it, is it as at May 2020 or is it the current rate? Uh, that is the start date. So I use, to calculate it, you basically put in the start date. Mm. You have the, the figure 
you have this the base start date of indexation, which is um, I can't remember what it is for May 2020, mm -hmm. and then you actually calculate it with the latest indexation, which will be coming out tomorrow. Um, oh. And then that actually works out. I've got a little spreadsheet with a little you know formulas in it already, which is nice and easy. You put in the figure, you put in the the latest indexation rate, and it tells you how much indexation to actually add on to the original contribution. And then you can actually, and then I put that all together in a demand notice, which is a nice letter to send to the developer. So they've got something to pay against. Yeah, the, the reason I was asking, obviously, RPI has shot up, isn't it, of late? And so it's it's not using the, the rate that applied back in May 2020. It's using no, we're, we're using that as the start date. As the start date, rather. As the start rate. date. May 20 is the start yeah. date, and I'm about to send a demand notice out tomorrow mm. and I'll be using what in effect is the October 22 RPI rate. That's really good. Because yeah. I guess over previous years, it hasn't, the RPI hasn't really moved very much. It's been almost on a fairly low base, but obviously, as we all know, that things have shot up. It has. And, and this is another reason why I don't have any issues with late payment, because some developers are now actually looking at this and being quite proactive and want to pay a little bit early. Sure. So, yeah. You also mentioned that um, in terms of the, um, the, the period over which, during which the, the, the um, contributions need to be spent, and some agreements are 10 years, but you're, you've also said that some of the newer ones are five years. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously a shorter period. We've got a shorter time to actually allocate the funds. Yes. Why, why the, is there a reason, do you know, why the, the period is short, being shortened, or is it just... This, this is this is down to individual developers um, normally and there is also an in difference in indexation rates normally we use RPI which tracks slightly higher than CPI but we have certain developers the larger ones such as for example countryside they prefer to use CPI and they prefer a five-year spend they are working on some of our really, really big developments and all Section 106 agreements are in negotiation between the us as the local planning authority and the developer. And for certain things, we come to an agreement where they want five years. We are happy to go for five years because we know that the, the use of the contributions written into the documents is something that we can actually, you know, target within that time and spend and allocate money accordingly. So the shorter period, the shorter, shorter period after which the money should be spent isn't a problem for us? It, it's not a problem because I'm monitoring really closely and I work very closely with the actual teams that, that are actually going to use the money, such as the operation teams for parks and open spaces and for the various mm. named organisations. So they're fully aware of, and as soon as we get the funding in, I'm straight in touch with them to make sure that they're ready to go. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Members, are there any other questions? Councillor Crofton. Jackie, would you mind um, just talking me through this um, affordable um, housing section 106? Yep. Because how, how does that work? Why are we claiming section 106 and how, what do we do with the money when we get it? Because we don't have any houses, so. Right. Um, as you'll see in the typical Section 106 requirements, we have two options for affordable housing. We actually have, in effect, on-site provision where the developer produces or builds affordable housing on the actual development, which is then taken over by is it a registered provider, like a housing association. So, you know, that is one way of doing it. Where we've got other developments where the developer is either doesn't have the room or doesn't want to provide the affordable housing on site we take a contribution in lieu of provision oh. so that's where we actually get the funding in so um that's actually then calculated what, what do we do with that money when we get it then well basically we sit there and we hold on to it and we work very closely i work very closely with my colleagues in housing and health who are responsible for the allocation of affordable housing um, through the housing register and through um, 
housing associations and I work with colleagues and we've been working with housing associations to actually for them to spend the money on our behalf to provide further affordable housing. We've just done so in Bishop Stortford and Ware last financial year and we have some other projects coming up. But it is it is a difficult thing for us because we don't have any provision to spend the money. No. So we are reliant on working with the housing associations. And I have to say, some of the funds that we've got are quite small to them because they're used to dealing in quite large amounts of money, you know, and sort of our amounts are smaller. So we do tend to pull them in a town and then actually put them in with the fund with the projects that they've got where they've got some funding and we add additional funding on the provision that you know they're providing extra housing for us to allocate so it is a partnership pro process thank you thank you okay members thank you very much indeed thank you the um if you can take you back to page 39 uh, the recommendation is to note and comment on the annual infrastructure funding statement 21-22 and also to uh, receive an update on the collection allocation of social assets contributions and the work that Jackie's been, been undertaking. I think, um, so we don't need to vote on this, we'd, we'd just be noting that. Thank you very much indeed for, for your very rare informative report on the work you're doing mm. in this matter. Thank you. No. Um, I think we're happy just to note those things, we don't need to vote. Jackie, you're very welcome to stay. Uh, although you're very welcome to go as well if you if you need to. Yeah, thank you very I've much. I've got to head off, I'm afraid. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much. Steve. Thank you. Good, good report. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us on to um, the shared internal audit. And that the this item begins on page 102. Simon, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is the second progress report covering the internal audit work program 2022-23. Uh, in it, a uh, reference is made to how far we've got through the work programme so far. Uh, we're currently running at about 44% of the work programme having been delivered by the end of October. Uh, we've also highlighted the outcome of four completed audits um, since the last progress report to this committee. And they are uh, in the table at the bottom of page 104 of the report pack. Um, all of those audits, um, pleased to say, provide what we define as a reasonable level of assurance and have attracted a, a relatively small number of medium and low priority um, recommendations. On page 105, uh, I'm highlighting to members that one new audit has been added to the work programme. That's an audit of uh, handling noise and nuisance complaints, which came to us as a result of a management request. That has been added to the work programme for the year, and we were able to um, resource that for the, from the um, contingency provision, which we build into the plan each year. I think the only other thing to highlight to members the status of the um, high priority recommendations is shown on page 110. Uh, there are currently two relating to payment card data security standards. Uh, I think as the report suggests, I, I do have a verbal update for members. Um, members should note that um, there is a reported delay from the council's supplier of software for the payment management system that's in use. An upgrade to that is essential uh, for the council, not least because of its um, links with the Transforming East Hearts programs that's quite important and I think I'm advised for that reason uh, in particular the matter has now been escalated um, with the supplier and is being managed as a priority by senior colleagues which includes Stephen. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions on the re report. Thank you Chair. Thank you. Um, quite a concise report this time. Um, thank you for the update on the outstanding points um, and I, I'm sure Stephen and his team will be working on that quite hard to resolve that before the next meeting. You're, you mentioned <laughs> no comment no comment from the uh, sexual officer on the minutes. The, 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 the audit on the noise management how long does a does, does would your work be on that sort of area be typically? It 
depends on the scope that we agree for each audit. In this particular case, I, I think the total time we set aside was uh, it, it equated to roughly 10 working days. So that would be a day and a half for planning, um, some days for field work, and then some days for, for, for reporting. Um, since uh, that audit was commissioned because it came as a management request, we did give it some priority and it's currently out as, as draft report. Once it's finalised, we can circulate that to members of the committee in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? If there aren't any questions, then I can take you to page 102 and the recommendations A, B, and C. Yeah, so we've got, you can see the recommendations A, B, and C. We need to vote on the advice, we need to vote on them on block. Are we happy for these recommendations to be moved? Ms. Fernando, Castle Crofton, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Got a proposal and a seconder. All those in favour? Thank you. Simon, thank you very much indeed. The next item um, relates to um, anti fraud. Has anyone heard from Nick? Well, members, with your agreement, we'll see Mr. Jennings is here just now. We'll, we'll maybe defer this to later in the meeting, see if it comes a little later on, if that's okay. So, in fact, the next two items actually. So, that brings us on to um, the budget, don't you know? Page 131 of AF. Stephen, are you going to? No. Yeah, apologies. Portfolio holders can address us. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, we're at the stage uh, now where the preparation for the budget for next year and the medium term financial plan for the next four years uh, is underway. Um, began in earnest um, some weeks ago. Uh, the paper tonight uh, follows on from the paper I presented to the executive towards the end of, of uh, last month. And basically it was uh, is intended to set the scene uh, against the way in which the budget is being put together. Um, of course, everybody will be aware of the various uh, events going on domestically and uh, around the world, which have had uh, a big impact on, on finances. Um, inflation, of course, um, has reached levels we've not seen for a generation. And of course, that's had impacts on things like the pay award and on our, on uh, what we have to pay our contractors. Uh, so the uh, papers represent the medium term financial plan for next year onwards. Um, and what we wanted to do, as we did indeed last year, is to sort of give some guidance to officers to help them uh, in building up the budget um, and sort of various assumptions we're going to make at this stage or endorse various assumptions. Uh, these being that we would um, yet again implement the five pound increase in council tax, which is the maximum that we can put in without a referendum, as, as you know. Uh, contract inflation of up to 4%, but no inflation in other goods and services. A pay award on um, going forward uh, would be up to 4%. But we may well get another year of new homes bonus. Um, as the, uh, the government sort of funding has not been, uh, is being rolled forward yet again for another year. Um, so uh, yes, so that, that, that's it in, in essence. Um, it's worthy of note that of course the transformation program is key to delivering the savings we're going to need in, in future years. Uh, that program is, is well underway, as, as, as members will be aware. Um, it's also worth pointing out that uh, we are looking to rephase some of the capital program um, in order basically to lessen the demands of the, cap of the uh, revenue repayments um, from the revenue account. Uh, however, uh, we are still at a relatively early stage. Um, we're looking to put a I'll come back to the executive uh, in December, and that's before um, the whole budget is going to be presented to a joint meeting, um, as it would normally be uh, in January. Uh, so that's really 
really thank you, Chairman, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. On, on the point I'd just like to make, following your, 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 your summary there, clearly we've got the, the autumn or the statement coming up, haven't we, from central government. <clears throat> and one of the, one of the kind of rumours that's sort of circulating is that they, they may relax the, uh, the cap on our ability to raise council tax. Now, clearly we don't know what's going to happen. Is that so? What would be the executive's position on that? Are you able to comment on that at this point in terms of the budget setting process? Uh, well, I'm, I'm hesitant really to say too much, obviously, because it is only purely rumour at the moment. Um, I think, really, in a sense, we cross that bridge when we get to it. But I think um, we would still be very cautious about using any more flexibility. So to raise council tax significantly above the five pounds, um, uh, so that, but you know I think we we can, we can only look at it once we know. I think that's the best I, I, I can say. I think I, 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 that's very kind. I wouldn't want to draw you any further on that okay. stage. Members, any questions? Elegance, do you have a question? Thank you. Um, on the uh, new homes bonus being rolled forward, could you uh, comment on? the executive's attitude to uh, considering this as a windfall rather than uh, a continued prop to uh, to budgets? Um, well, I'm not sure I describe it as a windfall, but it's it's certainly helpful. Um, you've seen from the report, £400,000 of the potential um, uh, bonus is being put aside that what we're going to know need to uh, refresh the, the district plan so that eases the pressure there um but uh, 400,000 i think it's from the i think that figure's right um is going to be put into uh, into reserves for uh, to help with future funding pressures yeah i think any money that we're receiving that we weren't planning on receiving would would be a windfall and uh, i just hope that we are um well i know from from conversations that we are trying to uh, find ways of being sustainable without that coming in in the future so um thank you so do you have a question thank you three one at a time i suppose um could you explain the the heart the theater um delay i'm i'm not certain members are totally familiar with with the wording that there's a significant delay what does that mean? Were you relying on that income um, from an earlier period, and how is that going to affect the accounts? I might need to ask Stephen to verify this, but um, yes, in the original business case, we were looking to receiving income from the theatre at an earlier stage than this, mm. but there have been, like, like any major project, delays occur um, regressively. What, of course, does mean with the the program being put back, although we're not getting the revenue, at the same time we're not having to pay for the, um, the minimum, minimum revenue provision that would be aligned with the borrowing. So it's kind of give and take. Trade off. Yeah. But how, 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 what's the reason for this delay? How do you know? I, I think it's been a number of factors. Uh, I remember when we went out to tender, I think when it was 18 months ago, we didn't get any um, uh, re returns that were anywhere near the kind of price we were looking for, so we had to go back out to the market again. That added quite a significant amount of period to the uh, to the whole process. Mm. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I've been reminded actually it was three times we needed to actually go out to the market to to get a, a contractor for the site. So the loss of the of the income from a, an earlier period is not going to damage the accounts in future years? No. Right, thank you. Second question, if I may, Chairman. Um, disappointing in here, we haven't got any uh, information about our investment properties that we've got, our investment portfolio. And I'm hopeful that we can actually put that on the work program to get a profit and loss account um, for the, in the next uh, audit and governance meeting, you know, and a balance sheet for, for the investment properties. You don't know 
how that's going. Is this, mil is this mill stream you mean? Well, mill stream, yes, and the investments that we bought properties that we other properties. I mean, it's important that this audit and governance committee has information about that because that's a significant um, uh, area of uh, income and hopefully profit. Uh, the Treasury report will actually give some information on that when it comes forward to the committee, I think, is it? Oh, later tonight, apparently. Thank you. Um, but there's no profit and loss account on that, and I'm hoping that we can see a profit and loss account on it or a you know, balance sheet because we'd like to know if it is actually making some money. Yes, okay, we can see what we can... I think it's easy if I, if I just ask Stephen to answer. Thank you. Uh, we didn't actually buy any properties. We've, we got investments in a property unit trust, two of them, one from Federated Hermes and one from Lothbury. Um, the returns last year on, on the fund was in 17, 18% mark. So since we bought them, and I'd have to go and clarify the date, but the gain since we bought them is running ahead of inflation and running ahead of interest rates. I couldn't give you the exact figure, but there's no profit and loss because we don't buy the properties ourselves. We, we just hold units in the trust. Well, we've got the property in uh, in where, haven't we? In uh, uh, it's um, um, yes, Dixon. We bought that. It's that the property in Crane Mead. The Crane Mead. Yes. We bought um, properties for uh, to let out for tenants. Yeah. For um, other things. I mean, why are we not regarding that as buying? Okay. Seems to me like we bought it. We, we can come back to the committee. But I do uh, with think we need on, all our investment, property investment property income. I do suggest, Chairman, that we um, have a proper look at that with profit and loss with evaluation on current values. I don't, I don't believe we've ever had anything from Mill Street, certainly, to this committee. And maybe, Sivy, you can. Um, Chairman, uh, Mill Street's business plan is reviewed annually by council, and it, it goes to council, direct to council because the, this council's audit function is carried out by this committee, but Millstream is a private company and the council has no involvement in its audit, other than um, we have a say in their external auditors. So what Millstream does as a company is not for the council to be involved in, because the Millstream is a separate company and the officers, when they're acting in, on that company, have a fiduciary duty to the company. So Millstream will produce its business plan and that goes to council. And it goes direct to council because that's what the council's constitution says. If you believe that there's a role for audit governance committee to look at that before it goes to council, then the constitution will need amending to say that. And in relation to um, our property, investment property has a particular meaning within our accounts. So some of the things that we bought are not actually investment properties and classified as investment properties in the accounts. For instance, Jackson Square is an operational asset because it's a car park and it's run as a car park. We need so you need to be. Uh, if you use investment properties in that sense, it has a particular meaning in the accounts. If you're asking for every single property we've got where we get an income, um, I can have a go at that, but that might take quite a while because we don't actually, I don't think we keep the detail, certainly not in the finance ledger. I'll have to ask my property team if they've got it in detail, but if you've got it, you can have it. Chairman, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it should be a council that is audit and governance part of East Hart District Council. And we need to know if it's a fundamental thing. The thing that's presented to council is very, very brief information. It's not adequate. It's not up to uh, challenged figures. And I think we really do need the, the properties we bought for investment, which Crane Meat is an investment, is we need to know its value. We need to know what it's currently worth. And we need to know that it's making a profit. We need to know what management charges it's sucking up. Is that part of the information that goes to council when the when the no. business plan goes? Uh, the, the business plan goes to the council. Yeah. There is a confidential part two um, section of it. But I say again, this is a private company. Yeah. The fact the council is its shareholder. Yeah. Um, and we'd be looking at it as as, as, as a shareholder. Uh, well, the, 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 if you if you want, I'd have to ask the I'd have to ask the monitoring officer's advice here because I, I think you're crossing over a line you can't cross over because you, you now look. The whole point of it being independent of the council and the company is. That it doesn't. It, it's a company. We haven't. We aren't. Crossed, we haven't crossed anything yet. We're just asking a question at this stage, aren't we? 
So I mean, we haven't crossed any lines yet. We, we, well, we well, if you're if you're going if you're going if you're going to have company brought here for a start, we'll have to be in part two. Yeah, and it'll have to be a part two confidential session. Yeah, I'm, I'm not suggesting necessarily we should. I just need to understand a bit more. Well, I, I'm, yeah. well I, I, as I say, we'll have to yeah. refer this to the monitoring yeah, officer yeah. because because it's been set up as a company. Yes, you can't, for instance, call Abasa in here and, and question Abasa to the nth degree about its business operations as a whole. So we're we'll not shareholders in Abasa. Just but. Councillor Williams, you just come in. Yeah, I, I can understand where Councillor is coming from. Um, we had the Financial Sustainability, Sustainability Committee that Councillor Crofton uh, sat on, assisted with, uh, and we made one or two investments when we were able to before the um, Treasury changed the rules on, on public borrowing. Um, so we had those one or two investments, and I think it's perhaps a reasonable question to understand what's happened to those investments since we took them on. So we see if we can get some information on the current valuation and the income we're getting from the tenant um, that we can perhaps feed back. But although I have to be careful that we're not disclosing anything that we, we shouldn't be. Part two. Yeah. 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 Councillor Crofton made, has made a, a reasonable point. I think, um, Stephen, are you, would you discuss this with the monitor? Is this something you will, a conversation you will have with the monitor officer then, do you think? Yeah, Chairman, I'll ask the monitoring officer to give some guidance on it. And I think Michelle and I can bring that back to the next committee, but we'll ask, because just need to be careful because it, because it has been set up as an arm's length company. And, and there's a da there's a danger of members acting as shadow directors sometimes. So you just need to be appraised of that yeah. if you are going to do this. I mean, if, if it wasn't appropriate to bring it here, could that information go to council when the business plan goes as part of that report? Would it be, could it be done that way, perhaps? Maybe you don't need to decide. Maybe you can come back to us rather than making a decision on sort of now. Well, the, the business the business plan first goes to the um, the shareholders advisory group, which is Councillor Goody, the chairman, and Councillor Gearing. So, so um, they sit on an advisory group with the shareholder, who's currently the chief executive. So that there's member oversight of it there on of the business plan, but. As for the information that comes to council, I think that's an agreed for an agreed format, but I think that was agreed before I arrived. So I'll have to check the mechanics of that. If you could, that would be good. And, and also yeah, to check whether it, if it would be appropriate to come to this committee or not. Councillor are you happy with that? that, um, that Stephen well, take if that it's away? a positive message, I'm happy with it. Because I mean, let's regard this as a shareholders meeting where you show up to council and we say jolly good. And, and then that, that, that doesn't need to go to that. Profit loss account or the you know balance sheet does not need to go to uh, full council. But if we're happy with it, we'll give it a rubber stamp. Let's um, leave can we leave that with you. You heard the sort of conversation points of council. Yeah, You're I mean Michelle has ministered it. We will we will discuss it with the monitoring officer. Ask that's the monitoring right. officer's view. That's perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the good. Uh, council, do you have another point? Well, only the last one on one fourteen. I, I just can you just elaborate a bit further on that because. Um, there's some pretty alarming things that we've used up our, um, been used up our capital program. So, is, do you want to elaborate on that, that paragraph, um, Jeff? Yeah. Um, obviously, we have quite an ambitious capital program, as as you know, um, with the leisure centres, the theatre, and uh, Old River Lane. Um, so they basically have between them tied up any um, capital reserves that we had. And you know, borrowing is planned, but being planned very carefully. So what this is saying is really we have no further headroom to increase that borrowing. So the, the capital program therefore really has to flex according to what we can afford to borrow. Now that, so really we, we cannot um, add anything to the program. And in fact, as I said earlier, we're looking maybe to see if we can rephase some of the capital program so that it's putting some of the pressure on um, the minimum revenue provision that we'd need to make sort of further further into the, into the um, MTFP. Were we needing to borrow any more money in the short term? Is that held? Not beyond I mean, what was agreed at Council last, uh, last March. All right. Thank you. Can I ask about um, inflation? Um, in the in the plan, so on the um, on page one three one recommendation A, contract inflation of up to four percent is being recommended. Is that over the life of the the MTFP? Because obviously, in when on the next page, um, on the proposals on page one three two, 
1.1. It talks about contract inflation set at 4% for 22 23, but as we all know, inflation has, 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 has risen to above that figure. And indeed, you use the example of the refuse contract having attracting a rate of 9.9. .9. Are we, if it is over the life of the MTFP, is it, are we thinking that the inflation will go up and up and maybe come back again over that life of the the plan, if you like, and so the average will be about four percent. I just needed to understand that. Maybe forgive me if I'm not understanding. Uh, Chairman, the four percent and the four percent refer to the twenty-three twenty-four period. So that that the four percent up to four percent for pay and four percent for contract inflation refers to the twenty-three twenty-four budget. So that's four percent, four percent, twenty-three twenty-four. Right. The MTFP, on the other hand, over the five years, assumes that inflation will fall back. Yeah. Over the MTFP, and and then and we've of course re had to, we had to rebate we had to rebase the MTFP to reflect the increase in the pay award mm. and the increase in, in the contract. So what that that inflation then feeds forward on that, and then we make our inflation assumption based on that higher figure. So for next year, twenty three twenty four is four percent and four percent, and then that falls back to two percent in twenty four twenty five onwards. Do we think? Is that a reasonable? I guess you must be, but it's a reasonable number. Well, is, is it how? How? I'm. I'm. I'm looking. I'm. Look, we look at projections which are produced by the Bank of England. We look at projections produced by the Office of Budget Responsibility. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm looking at projections that say four percent next year, and I'm purely guessing after that. And if I if I knew what the rate of inflation was in two years' time, and I knew what what the economy is going to look like in two years' time, yeah. I wouldn't be sat here. I'd be sat on a yacht in the Caribbean. I think. Well, quite, quite. <laughs> but it. But, with the refuse contract running at nine point nine percent, I just, I just, I'm struggling to. The the, ref, the refuse contract, you, you need to understand that the inflation on the refuse contract is made up of a basket of items. Right. So one of those items is private sector pay, which ran at eight percent, and the other one was diesel, which ran at thirty six point nine percent. Right. Now diesel hasn't come down dramatically, but it has come down Kinda slightly and yeah. stabilising. So the largest movement on that contract was the diesel. So fifty about fifty percent of the contract is pay, which ran at eight point eight percent, and then uh, I think of the remaining fifty percent, something like thirty five percent of it is related to diesel, which went up by an inflation of thirty six point nine. So it's the basket, it's the, it's the individual basket of indices on each contract which will drive it, and it's principally being pay and fuel that's driven it. Right, because refuse depots don't consume that much electricity. In. No, I see. Fine. I um, we, I mean, I've assumed that it falls back to the, the Bank of England target inflation. So um, the latest predictions, which was before we know what's in the fiscal event, was, you know, two years of contraction. And then, you know, inflation would actually go below what the Bank of England expectation, what the Bank of England target was. But I'll wait and see what the Office of Budget Responsibility says after the fiscal event. Times change. You know, we base what we, we put in here on the Bank of England, the Office of Budget Responsibility, because that's the best we've got to go on. Well, you can't do much better than that in the circumstances. Well, I agree, I'm... absolutely. I just, I, they just seem to me quite low numbers, but got reasonable grounds for believing that they could. Well, they could I mean, be... that, that they, they were in line with what, the, what most people's base case inflation assumptions yeah. were when I wrote this report. The, the problem with writing these reports is by the time they arrive here, things have moved on. Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, on page 133, you, you've got the um, the services grant you mentioned from central government um, of 411,000 pounds, and, and, and I think it's it's sort of it's the future of that grant is kind of in doubt. Um, but but you've, you've you've decided or agreed that in the event of there no being no funding reform, the grant will continue in full. Do, are you happy that that's a prudent approach? I mean, maybe you would say yes, I guess, but I mean, I just need to understand why. Asking. We're taking our advice from LG Futures, who advise um, all the authorities in Hertfordshire about, about local government finance. So the, their, their view, and therefore the view of LG Futures customers, and, and anybody who's read the County Council's report will see that they're assuming that all the, all the parts of the local government finance system this year will roll forward, simply because there's been no consultation with local government, and they, they won't change the, the effort to the fairing funding formula without significant consultation. Now that Michael Gove is back in um, in 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 uh, yeah in Marsham Street, now he's back. We expect and we expect that there's a very good chance that he will put planning fees up. Now we're expecting a 35% increase in planning application fees, which will um, produce about about 300,000 pounds for a budget. It's a positive effect. So we're hoping that will come forward 
as part of the, the levelling up and regeneration bill. But because Michael Gove is back and he was a major mover in the fairer funding formula, we're expecting that once the finance settlement is concluded in February, we're expecting about April, he, he will start motoring on the consultation. And the consultation, we think, will, will end up in East Hearts being on any, any sort of floor that there is for compensation and damping out. But we will be basically, we have too much money from the government as far as the government's concerned for, for what we need. So to be a wealthy. We're considered district. wealthy. And, and, and this, this is the problem with the local government finance system in that, in that um, relative resources, which is the amount that the government thinks that you're raising in revenue, they use ANCT, which is average national council tax. So they take your average, so, so average national council tax, obviously, doesn't reflect your actual council tax. So average national council tax must be something like 15 to 20 pounds higher than what East Hearts actually levies. But the government doesn't take into account that you have got a lower tax level. They whack through the system a ANCT figure and they've stopped telling us what the ANCT figure is. So I'm going off the last time I saw an NCT figure, which is about 10 years ago. So we, our council tax must be 15 to 20 pounds less than ANCT. So if you've kept your council tax at increasing your council tax at, at average national council tax levels or above, you're laughing at this system. If you've been prudent and kept your tax low, it's penalising you. And unfortunately, the system is penalising East Hearts for keeping its council tax low. Because the government assumes that you're raising far more in council tax than you actually are. And it's a fault of the system. Thank you. That's interesting. Thank you. On page 135, we talk about the... Um... The waste contract and um, we, we, we're allocating another million pounds to the budget to meet potential increases in contract costs going forward but, but that's obviously coming from reserves which i guess but not, it was, it was, is that one of part of the saving you've got to find i guess because there's some, there's some fairly big numbers we've got to, still got to find yeah and as, as part of the change over to weekly food collection what we're proposing is that if you're if you're maximizing the amount you're recycling and you're putting anything that can rot or go smelly into a food cabinet container there's not a lot else that's going in your residual waste bin. So instead of collecting it every fortnight, we'll collect it every three weeks to save the money to, um, to introduce the food waste. That's part of what, what's been gone into the proposal to go out to tender. So part of the savings proposals are actually self-generated by the revenue from, from the refuse and recycling contract. But there are quite a lot of risks around the, the contract, particularly about um, the change over to the government mandated collection methodologies and also some of the changes to how recycled materials are, are, are distributed and kept as well. So there's lots of unknowns and there's lots of risks in this, but we're, we're, we're working along on, on the basis of what we do know, and it's, it's sufficiently flexible to tweak it should there be issues. But thank you. it will have to come out of savings from elsewhere, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, thank you. A bit further down on, right, we, we talk about the capital programme. Um, and, and the the um, the possibility of taking a scheme to planning permission and then selling it with planning permission rather than us sort of holding it till fruition. That's an interesting. I've not, I've not heard that before. How, I don't know. I guess it's too early to say. But how how likely do you think that might that might be? We might do that with some projects. Is that a likelihood or just a possibility this time? Um, we have been looking at Elizabeth Road which is um, shops with the flats above them for redevelopment, we will take that to planning permission and then we will, we will review it again, seeing what the market is doing, but it is highly likely that we will sell that because a small developer with their own, their own um, workforce will be able to develop that site and turn a profit. If we go out to tender, we will not turn a profit on it, we think. We just need to check that, check that, but we doubt we do, it made sense. And it made sense when we started down um, the route of redesign of knocking it down and redesigning it. We did try to we, try, we did try to redevelop it, but the foundations weren't strong enough. Basically, we couldn't put extra extra stories on because it, the buildings would have collapsed. So it was necessary to actually start to to knock it down to redevelop it. And the way we have gone about it is a new build. Um, <clears throat> and we thought we could, we thought we were making something like a twelve percent return on it. And then there's been all the uncertainty in the supply chain disruption, global prices increasing, etc. And then the cost of borrowing as well, and it's it, it, we don't therefore, therefore think it currently washes it, fa it washes its face. We will check once we have if we get a planning permission from DMC. It's an if because you know goes to DMC. Uh, if we get planning permission, we will then but we then be able to take a view of will this make any sense in the market or are we better off selling this? So, so part of the reason for doing this is, is a, not, not like a pragmatic approach because it makes sense for us to do it rather than just doing it because we haven't really got the 
the resources to. to uh, look, we, we were starting to read about them. I mean, I mean, they were. The, the shops were very small. They are very small. They've got flat roofs on on parts of the buildings as well. So it's becoming dilapidated and you could get far more housing on that land and, and bring bring a bit of life back and, and, and more more appropriate shop sizes to reflect the modern world. So it, 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 it was tired in needing redeveloping anyway. So we started down this line and we thought by redeveloping it and put the flats over, over putting the flats overhead, we can actually turn, we can actually make it very short term borrowing as basically a bridging loan. And it would actually make capital receipts to repay the cost of the redevelopment and leave the council with some capital receipt on top. And that was the plan. But we don't now think that the capital receipts will match the actual cost and we'll be left with a borrowing overhead. And that's what we want to avoid. And that's just the movement of inflation and the, the movement from the supply chain difficulties. That's interesting. Thank you. Uh, on page 136, the, the Transforming East Arts programme. I'm interested, interested to read that other authorities have, have adopted a slightly more aggressive model in terms of staff working arrangements rather than rather than a 50-50. They're allowing staff to work more at home, even, even completely at home. Is that... Is that, is, is, that, is that a pressure this council might find because, because you know, to, to attract staff and also to keep existing staff, we may need to offer that to more rather than sort of going for a 50-50 approach? Chair, Chairman, I think I, I was more making the point that if we need to save more money rather than keeping a, a bigger office space, we could contract further if we, if we flex the 50-50. Now, I know there are dangers in that because um, up the road, there is a very large building which uh, you can be lucky to see another human being in it as you walk around the corridor some days. It's, I think you find so, you know, because the county, the county's policy is work at home. And everybody has. And now they've got now they've got vast office buildings with nobody in them. So they're looking to reduce their estate. And I know that um, there's a debate raging up, up, up at County Hall about what is the future of County Hall? Because obviously that's a huge amount of office space and, and a, you know, a heritage building. And there's just not, not, not many people in it. So, but if you if you can contract further into the office space, that then offers more space to potentially rent out or potentially sell the whole building, put complex off and move somewhere else. And I, I think I was raising raising there that the 50-50, we may have to flex that if we want to, you know, contract into a smaller space to rent out more space. That's that's why that particular paragraph is there. Okay. I, I wasn't, I, I mean, I've not taken account of any of the, um, the staffing implications or anything like that. I know a review of the the blended working offers underway in HR. I was thinking more from a risk, almost like a risk register perspective. That you know, keeping and attracting new staff and keeping existing staff. Do we have to offer them more attractive working conditions to keep as part of the what could be more attractive? Part of a than seeing me new chairman. Well, yes, there are there are many advantages to working at home. I mean, I get far more done at home because it's not possible for people to walk up and interrupt me. However, you do lose, and I do value coming in into the office because you can do some meet, you can do some meetings face to face, and you can do some more creative things face to face that you can't do on a TV camera at home. It's the days I it's the days I come in here and I spend all day on a camera that I find a bit depressing, but uh, with the interruptions. But um, there are many many advantages to keeping the fifty fifty hybrid model. So th uh, there are many disadvantages, uh, you know, against against what other people are doing in the workplace, but. Um, I don't have a problem with the 50 50 model. I think it works really, really well for some of the things that finance have to do. And I know, you know, some teams do come together on those 50, you know, the days in the office and, and again, the benefit of that. But I, I think if we were said everybody back to the office full time, that would cause some major issues because I think, I think there would be some um, staff unhappiness at that and perhaps going elsewhere where they, they offered more flexible working. But, you know, everybody's an individual. And, you know, some, I, know I know there are some people who don't do 50 50, they do 100% in the office. There are three members of staff of mine who have mandated must be in the office full time, as well as the caretakers. But there are some members of staff who come into the office full time because they like it in the office and they prefer it in the office. And they prefer it to being at home. And that's absolutely fine. We don't have a problem with that. But we have, we have said that, you know, no more than 50 percent at home to make sure that people are in the office, that, you know, the people are seeing their colleagues and also have that that chance to interact. But are you doing the risk register? Tonight. I will be covering it, Chairman. Yeah, forward to that. Thank you. On page one three six, you, you mentioned a couple of possible significant sources, significant no less sources of um, additional revenue not included in the MTFP. Um, 
how which i think the fact that they're not i think is prudent so i just wonder how maybe how likely do you think they may be can you give us a bit of color I did allude to the planning, the planning fees going above 35%. Now Michael goes back as Secretary of State. I, I think I'd probably move that into the um, highly likely. The new burdens fund, um, we will get we will get new burdens funding because that that's that's the agreement of the new burdens, the, bur the new burdens um, agreement that we have, but how they do the new burdens funding will really, really matter. Because I've seen civil servants do new burdens funding and district councils ending, ending up with £301.43 because they've done something on the back of a fact packet. And there are there are some attempts at new burdens where they will actually ask you in detail for your spending on things and, and look at what the, the anticipated costs would actually be in practice before they come up with new burdens funding. So much will depend, much will depend on, on what their attitude to new burdens funding is. And much will depend as well on the Treasury's attitude towards charging for garden waste. Because the Treasury has gone white at the thought of having to compensate local authorities for charging for, for green waste fees. So the reintroduction of a universal garden waste service, I don't think the Treasury can afford. So I, I, th I think the government will, will say that you can continue charging for garden waste um, in order to fund that service. but. Mm. But what exactly the new burdens funding will be as a result of this, because we're not yet clear how materials are being handled and stuff like that. Mm. And also there's the introduction of new elements um, of how waste is funded as part of this new collection system, which reminds me, Chairman, would you like me to invite somebody from um, the Hertfordshire County Waste Partnership to talk about um, the funding models um, for waste going forward? Because I've seen a presentation on it and I thought that might be useful for you as well. Yeah, that would be... Um... Members, I don't think you would agree. That would be very interesting. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. I think are we all having that. Councillor Bell, are you happy with that too? Thank you. Great. Yes, we'd all be very pleased to hear that. Thank you. I just want to talk about the general fund balance. In fact, obviously, you'll be keeping a close eye on that. And also, the, obviously, add the adequacy of the council's reserve going forward, moving forward across the life of the NPFP. We've talked about reserves before, and I think I've mentioned that there was a time when auditors commented maybe we were, you know, we were almost too well serviced in that department. How do you see the movement in reserves behaving over the life of the medium term financial plan at this stage? I mean, I clearly, I clearly it's very early in the process. At this stage, I can, I can see us using um, the reserves down to about their minimum level to, to assist with phasing in and the budget savings that we need to in order to balance the budget in the medium term. So um, in, in terms of reserves, do we have a vast amount of reserves in the council? No, actually, compared to other councils, we have quite low levels of reserves. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, but it is what it is. I, um, I mean, uh, when you set the budget, you remember I, I, I did a Section 25 report that goes alongside it mm -hmm. and I set the minimum level of balance at yeah. about three million for the general fund. Not that a great deal, of, we're not a great deal above that three million now, so. Do you think we'll, we'll eat into that a bit? Do you think? Possibly. Because, I mean, it's very difficult to tell at the minute um, what the out we're still working through the, the next quarter's outturn report. Um, I can say I can see us running a deficit this year. Yes. So that will eat into it. And in the future years, if we can't, if, if, if something unexpected comes along, there's not a great deal of cushion sat there. No. So I'm just well, we obviously you'll be, you'll be keeping a close eye on it. And, and, and the, you know, there is an element of borrowing which I have kept back for unforeseen events. Mm. So, but so when I say when I say the borrowing is maxed, I really do mean that because if you take any more borrowing, it's going to eat into that contingency amount that I'm keeping. Mm. Now, you know, there's a question of how we're going to fund the waste containers for the um, for the weekly food collection for a start. If that falls on us, then that that's part of that contingency, yes. which I'm holding. That would then be expense. So there isn't there isn't a great deal of financial resilience re amounts of reserves left. I mean, we are going to use some of the interest equalisation reserve potentially to cover some of these increased costs on borrowing in order to, to ease the MTFP through. And all the business cases are predicated on um, all the borrowing running the full 30 year term, whereas I intend to structure the borrowing to basically repay it when the MRP level reaches, uh, reaches a level to repay it. So that mitigates some of the interest rate increase as well so to produce a financial, res a financial result that's very similar to the business case. 
short-term borrowing arrangements. We're still using short-term borrowing arrangements because that's what the Treasury advisors are advising us to do. And we're we will continue to do that. We will, we will continue to do that whilst it whilst it's cheaper than locking it in. Sure. Do we still use Link? Yes, we still use Link. Are we on the subject of Link? Are you I think doing all right? I mean, obviously they they've been in the news in the in the news for various reasons of late, and there, there's a there's a buyout, isn't there, in the in the wind in the wind? Do you think we do you think that would that affect what they're doing? Well, Chairman, I don't really rate them anyway, so I'm going to. Uh, can't really say anything polite to be honest. Oh, are they, are, are, I, I, I had Link in the past and then I had their competitor Arling Close and I think the level of advice and service you get from Arling Close is streets ahead of Link. Why, why, why would we keep, are we under contract or something? Um, we, we go out to tender for them and, and Arling Close won the last tender. So uh, Link won the last tender rather so um, which I found disappointing and some of my, I think my, my Treasury accountant found disappointing as well. I mean, I, I've had Link and I've had Arling Close, and although Arling Close are more expensive, my God, you get your money's worth from Arling Close. So are we, we're stuck in a contract for a bit? On, on I think it's 2024, potentially, would be the contract change date for Treasury Advisors. I need to check that. I must say, reading some of the stuff that Link produces, it would seem to be bland. But, but, but my, I, I thought land, that. I think that's polite, Chairman. Well, I... Interesting. Oh, that's it. Yeah. I mean, my, my own personal experience of, of Link is that they come in and say how great they are, and then and then and then they they give you a few words about your balance sheet, and then you're off, and then they're off. Whereas Arling Close will come in and talk to you and actually make sure you understand things like bail in, um, and they they introduced us to um, money market funds where we could trade electronically, buy and sell, and buy and sell the, the units in those money market funds. So it became effectively like term deposit liquidity levels. Mm. Uh, they introduced us to covered bonds, which is, um, these are bonds which are sort of like covered 120% by mortgages. And if the mortgage goes bad, the bank has to take that out and then put in another another mortgage of, of high quality. So these are British banks. And, and you know, you, if you can get into the covered bond markets in the last five years of their life, you can make quite substantial returns on them where, you know, this council doesn't have access to that. We don't have access to the the money multiple. I mean, we used to have a trading system where we could trade um, unit trust in and out of market funds, um, and, but they were always AAA rated and agreed. And you know, Arling Close would overlay that if you were trying to put one where you shouldn't, etc. So the level from Arling Close was considerably more than you get from Link. You get what you paid for as well. So. Well, in different instances, everything else. That's very interesting. That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. On, on Appendix A, on page one four four. Is it, I mean, are we still to yet to find sort of somewhere around eight hundred thousand worth of savings across the life of the mid per year? Uh, yes, that's true. Well, at we, least I should say. Not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for next year, the, the figure is eight hundred and twelve thousand, as you can see. Um, the work that's been done so far suggests that much of that can actually be found from structural changes within the organisation further efficiencies um so in fact i mean this is still being worked through as a bit primitive to, to give um too definitive an answer but um it's looking likely that there'll be little that we will need to change sort of policy wise in order to make further savings or increase revenue but that's the detail which we're coming to um executive and then joint um audit in, in later on in the cycle um when we get to the savings in future years uh then yes when we are working through from next summer onwards um uh, then we are going to have to really look very very carefully at all areas of, of council spending and potential revenue growth that's understood thank you thank you members other questions um we go back to page 131 and we've got some recommendations a to e can we can we take them on the block so we're just noting so we're not voting on this okay so we're just noting I maybe mean, obviously council williams have mentioned at the beginning of the process this is this is an early sort of some set of guidelines really you're setting out for officers to help them in their work for the setting, working on the emergency financial plan and we'll wait to see what thursday brings i guess in terms of how that might might change some of these guidelines, members, I'll be happy just to note these um, guidelines. Thank you, as well as well, thank you very much indeed. And Stephen, thank you. So that brings us on to item nine, which is treasury management. Yeah, 
page 163. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, Ch Chairman, if you if you recall, the committee sees the, um, the, the annual treasury and investment strategy um, before the start of the year and before it goes to full council for approval. It sees the mid-year review uh, when the mid-year review comes here. And then after the end of the financial year, it sees the annual review which is the look back against, against how we did against what our treasury strategy was. So this is the, the look back at the 21-22 financial year and how that and how we did against um, our treasury policies, et cetera, so that members can see um, uh, the um, executive summary on page seven, which is page 173 of your pack, which is um, what, the, what we expected our... Um, capital expenditure to be and, and how we vary it against that and, and borrowing, et cetera. So, and you can see the effect there of, of some of the um, delays to the capital schemes. I mean, I must be the only, I think I must be a very rare CFO when I say that my capital program got interrupted by dead Romans. Uh, and so then um, we talk about um, Capital expenditure unfinanced in the year, which unfinanced in the year means by borrowing effectively. It's it's one of those lovely local government finance terms designed to bewilder anybody but, but people who work in local government. Um, and talk about overall borrowing need and um, gross borrowing positions, etc. And then our treasury position as at the end of the year. So you can see that we've got a PWLB loan, which um, was taken out back in the 1980s at 8.875 percent which we are holding to the end of its term simply because the reborrowing rates to, to repay these loans to the pwb is, is bonkers money because the interest rates have started to catch up a bit on that one, aren't they? well might look like a bargain in a few years i mean i i, I can't i can't predict um but you can see the market rate at the market rate on 20 million is um 0.875 percent so um, that the the market rate is 0.875 there on that on the on the borrowing that we have on short term on the money markets. Um, then we can see, uh, the, you know, if we took a more structured approach, so what, what, how much more expensive would it be? Do, do you think if we took a bit like a term of 25 year loan? If, you, if you're taking 25 year uh, loan, then they'll want like the PWB is asking for. So it's because it's short term and. and, and um, what we pay, what we pay in the short term, in the term market, is not linked to the um, is not linked to the base rates. It's linked to what's called Sonia, which is the Bank of England um, calculation of the uh, the overnight. So that replace some LIBOR. Yeah, because LIBOR could be LIBOR could be um, manipulated, whereas Sonia can't. So so um, so Sonia is is below the base rate but tracks it. Um, so that's what what the money market is is in the term deposit market is it tends to track Sonia. But we are paying uh, the PWOB because the PWOB is financed by government gilts. So whatever the gilt market is doing, um, that that's what that's what sets the interest rate effectively for the PWOB because the Treasury will 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 take out loans. Um, when you when you ask for PWOB loan, you have to wait two days to get the cash. And that's because the Treasury are busy selling gilts to cover it. And then whatever the gilt rate is, the Treasury will add a, a few basis points on top to make a profit. And that, and that becomes the rate to local government. Is that guilt yield? Is that based on yields or, or the prices? It, it, it's, it's, I've got to be careful. It, it, it's whatever the rate is on the, on the, on the, on the, on the face rate, the, the rate on the face of the guilt. Right, I see. So, so when they offer the guilt, um, people bid and, and you know, you, you're, you're paying whatever that percentage rate is right. that's bid. So what we've seen is that guilts went shooting way above inflation and, 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 um, Shortly after Mr. Quateng sat down, they started hiking majorly up into the five, six percent. Now they've started to fall back down, but it's still very much above um, where the base rate yeah. is. But PWB borrowing is, is, is determined by the gilt rates and not by the Bank of England base rate, which is why we're using the short term money market now, because that's tracking so low compared to where bond yield, where, where bond yields are. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. And then we have um, the review of the strategy, which includes all the you can yeah you can see this on your rates and essentially so the the review of the economics that were going on at the time, some PWB rates for information, um, and then there is borrowing outturn, okay, investment outturn. So the um, showing where our resources came from in order to fund the investments, and on page uh, 187 you have Lothbury 
Now the net return on Lothbury for the year, and these are for the year, was 17.5% on Lothbury, and Hermes was 21.1% for the year. You mentioned earlier that the return on these funds were far and away above inflation. If things change, for instance, if property doesn't look quite so attractive an investment in six months' time or whatever, would we look to exit those investments, do you think? You can you, you you can sell the units. You can sell the units. You can either sell the units back to the institutions, or you can sell them. Or you can or you can make size, a side sale between the two. But um, there is a significant demand and waiting time to enter both of these property trusts, and these property trusts have tended to be ahead of the curve of of where property is going. So they 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 you know they they came out of the big out of town shopping centres a while ago because they said we don't think this is where the, the properties go, property future is going. So they tend to be ahead of the market. Um, and, and, and their return, I mean, I think both of them um, publish their returns on their website. So you can go into um, Lostbury's and you can see and you can track it for five years, 10 years or just the year and, or just the quarter. And, and you, you, you can track their returns. I think I think their worst performance was minus four was minus four percent. And that was in. One of the in, in, that was when COVID broke out, so they, they, their fund fell by four percent for the year. I think other comparative property funds would plunge like 25%. So they have a different sort of property class that they're investing in. These things are a mix of sort of office, industrial and uh, retail, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, like I mean, the, 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 the decision to enter into these two property funds, I think, was 2015. So yeah. way before I was here. But I think they, from what I was told, they were very carefully researched mm. as to be, you know, and, and I've had a nervousness about so much money in property, but they seem to be consistently ahead of whatever property trend curve there is. And, you know, they seem to be, they seem to be saying now that things that the rest of the market will say in about two years time. So. Right. Well, okay. Thank you. But I, I don't know a great deal about them, but if you, if you want to, I could get Nicholas to do so. But I mean, their, their websites, the, the websites are there. So I, I can send members the website links if they want. Yeah, that would be good. But if you wouldn't mind, rather than take up any of time on it, if we could send the link for them, we could have a look at that ourselves. Mm. Lovely. Thank you. No, I think I've bored you all enough now, so I'll, I'll shut up. On page 175, another table at the bottom. The CFR general fund. It's, um, I just, just wanted the, the figure at the bottom right in the right hand corner, 23.1. Should that column add down? Should, it be, should, should, the, should the opening balance be included in that or not? Or is it just. Yeah, it should have been, yes. Oh, not that it makes much of a difference or anything much. But Apologise, Chairman. So as I read it, I suppose nothing else. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, I'll make sure that's correct as an executive. That's why it comes to audit and governance for scrutiny. Any comments? I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's an interesting document. It sets up where we are. We do, it looks well, anyway. I think, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, in which case, the recommendation is on page 163. We've examined and commented on it. Are we happy with those with the proposal? That's oh, yeah. that's a Fernando um, proposed because I've been second. Are those in favour? That's unanimous. I thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, which register? Page one nine three. It's the corporate risk register for quarter two. Um, since um, quarter one, um, Graham Mully, the insurance risk officer, has left to pursue a career on the border as a as part of the UK border force. Don't ask me why, because I don't know why. Um, so consequently, what I've done is I've handed over responsibility um, for uh, compiling the, the strategic risk register to um, Noel and Ben's team. And we are will be collecting that information as part of our normal performance management routines um, through the Pentana uh, risk system. So. Um, Heads of service will start to compile it on the Pentana risk um, system and, and, and Noel will coordinate the report. So, um, 
page page one hundred and ninety six sets out where the um where, where the risks have changed. Um, some stuff from me on um, on the latest MTFP predictions uh, and update on the risks to the district plan. Uh, climate change on some of the pieces of work that have been done across about decarbonisation, and also a little bit of an update on COVID, as well as staff capacity. So, and then the, it's the usual um, risk detailed risk registers where members can see um, the mitigations and controls, and, and mainly concentrate on the update on the current position under each of the risks where uh, th that's set out, and um, what's happening on those risks. As I say. Um, Ben very kindly offered Noel as a resource to um, compile this um, for us. So I'm very grateful to Ben for signing an officer to do that for me. And, and the register is here. If there, if there are questions, I'll do my best, Chairman, but I, I may have to give a written response. Thank you. Uh, I'll cast Fenner. Thank you. It's just a comment more because we have talked about it at previous meetings um, that we still have resilience of IT at A3, but we and that is the event will probably occur annually. I think everyone in this room is well aware that we have significant issues with our IT on a more than annual basis, including last week where you start server went down and documents couldn't be accessed actually at all. So again, I'm aware that work is ongoing to try to reduce that risk. But again, I do think we are slightly under um, emphasizing what the current risk is. I would. I think. I think we've had conversations along those, along those lines, almost every meeting. So I would certainly support that. Is that something we can, you can, take away? Councillor, so having spent, having spent, having done nothing for the last six days, as Ben has probably done nothing over the last six days, dealing with the incident and. Um, I'm at the end of my wits, Chairman, on the subject. So, um, I will I will feed back to the Deputy Chief Executive the feelings of the committee. Because the, the the minutes uh, one of the one of the minutes on the when did we were told it was going to happen? We used to get a little box, didn't we, with with the little things, little dots in in a, in a box, in the four quadrants of a box, didn't we? And we, did, we haven't got that this time. Maybe that's is that was that intentional? Do you think? Anyway, I think at the, at the September meeting, and oh, the risk matrix. Yes, that 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 should be here, and it it isn't. But to be fair, you know, it was his first time running this report out of Pentana, so you're, you're right. You're right. It, it, it isn't there. So well, it's only it's a pictorial representation of the. Or is it page on page, the, the table on page one? Yeah, and I mean the Pentana system can actually can actually produce it, and that's one of the benefits that you can actually see that online. And it, it, yes, it should have been included. This was discussed, and, and actually, um, the deputy chief exec was here for that meeting, and she said that it might be useful for members to receive an update on failed cyber attacks to demonstrate how well the council was mitigated. Did you spot that earlier? I don't know whether that's something we could get. There, there, well, I think I think there are two two elements to this, chairman. There's the external risk. Of, of being attacked and being and being brought down by attack from from outside forces for which we have not yet been brought down by outside forces yeah, but if you want to talk about being brought down by internal forces you know the thing is i don't know about my colleagues on the committee but you know in my day job cyber is like almost at the top any you know we do we do risk registers a lot for our clients and cyber related stuff is like the you know the, the one that flashes you know i don't know whether, whether anyone else has that experience i certainly and so that's why I've, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I maybe it's slightly different for account in the council well, summit sitting I, than, I think what you have to remember as well count, uh, Ch chairman is um, the amount of our systems that don't talk to the internet because they don't talk to the website an awful lot of our systems sit in isolation from the website and the only thing you get is an email to an officer who then starts inputting it into the system so because we don't have deep system integration and because our digital infrastructure isn't isn't out where it should be one of the advantages of that is it's very difficult to attack us because it's very difficult to attack the housing benefit system if you can't get into the housing benefit system because it's not directly linked to the website yeah so it's it, it's when you start and when you start using those digital 
um, enhancements, unless you get your cybersecurity right in those, that yes, that's the attack vector they come in on. Mm. But if you're attacking East Hearts, you're going to basically be attacking an email. Yeah. Like a spoof, like the email saying, please pay money now to so and so. Oh, I get those all the, all time. the time. I'm, I'm an expert at spotting those. <laughs> finding another partner in this because we're about to spend millions aren't we with uh, Stevie on our, our new system what are we going to do carry on or are we going to change into finding another partner um, this has certainly come to a head in recent times um, we have formed a new joint uh, ICT uh, joint committee governance group uh, with three three of us from East Hearts, including Councillor Huggins, um, three uh, equivalent members at Stevenage, plus uh, senior officers. Um, because, uh, yes, clearly something needs to change. Um, and we're really sort of taking, stripping it right back to to basics to see what we need to do to, to rebuild this in the, in the direction that we needed to go in. Um, but we're sort of starting from a position where we are, um, and we need to be very, very careful that, uh, you know, that um, any any change approach is not going to leave the council worse off. But and it's got to be everything we do moving forward is not to be to the advantage to our advantage. Uh, so we need, we're thinking it through very carefully about what our options are. But I think it's reasonable to think that um, we, we should be starting to scope out what um, the nuclear option would, would be for this council. But now we've got to this point. Thank you. I mean, going, going, thank you for that. Now going back to Councillor Fernando's comment about the score that's, that's, that's subscribed to um, one of the scoping IT systems. I mean, I, 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 our members minded to agree that we should suggest to officers that it should, or and they need to, to um, the executive, that it should be a higher, higher score and a four score. I certainly would. That's what do you think? Um, it's, it, I'm, I'm not uh, informed enough about the, uh, the damage that could be done with these systems that aren't connected are the ones that could cause us the greatest um, reputational damage, at least. Um, it strikes me more that we should be more like a, a, a B4 than an A3. So um, it's um, it, it's difficult for me to comment. Um, this, this item isn't just cyber, is it? Cyber is within the overall the section that, con that contains performance resilience. And security of IT systems. So it's it's the whole IT. Yeah, and rather than just cyber, it's in its on its own. On its own. Our, our IT system, as as we've detailed, is is suffering, but the security of it is not. So um, that's why, for me, I question whether the impact is correct. But I agree with uh, Councillor Fernando's points that actually likelihood we the timeline we're looking at monthly events rather than annual events. Sorry, I take Council Huggins' point, and I think it's it's a difficult one because different things have different risks, and therefore things like IT failures are more likely as a B four. However, the impact of things like revs and benefits going down actually are critical, and therefore, if you amalgamate it, arguably we probably are at a A four risk. I would overall, I would certainly agree with that. Absolutely. Can I just point out in, in this last outage, perversely, because they had not yet upgraded to from Windows seven. Revenues and benefits and customer services were the only two parts of the council that continued to function at one hundred percent IT. IT. So miraculously, by whatever, by whatever being or entity is above us or you know influencing this stuff, customer services and revs and bends just ploughed on because they were totally unaffected. It was everybody else that sat there with increasing levels of frustration, but revs and bends, not not a peep out of them because they were working and your customer service staff were working as well. So it was it was it was the rest of us that were struggling. So, so just to so just to reassure you, but you know, even if it's a fluke, 
we, Revs and Bens and customer services were, were unaffected by this last outage. Yeah. Sorry, just, uh, yeah, not to go over the point, and I take it and it was a, a fluke, but again, it just comes back to the reason I still on Windows 7 is because our IT systems aren't up to date, and therefore that in itself is a... Yeah, is an issue. So. I, I, yeah, to, totally, yes. totally, 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 I just wanted to, I just, oh, yes. because yes. you mentioned Revs and Bank, I just wanted to give the information point that they weren't affected on this particular incident. I wasn't in any way suggesting that. Change the rightness of what you're saying, which you're totally 100% right, yes. We have it then to conclude as a recommendation from this committee that it moves to an A4. Okay, well, we'll go back and we'll come back to that when we look at the recommendation thing. Just, and we can vote on it at that time, but I'll, I'll make a note of it. Are there any other? Are there any other comments? On um, page 194, para 3.1 talks about the leadership team has set risk, a risk tolerance level. Do you know how, how does that how does that work? If, if you remember on the matrix that should be there, yeah, yeah. If, if you've got if you've got A4 oh, and then you've got you've got like, like um A B three, and then it, it, it's basically that top right hand corner of the matrix yeah. that we we that I call it the hot zone. And, and that's where the risk tolerance is because they're so important that we manage them on a almost daily basis. So you don't want many risks in there, which is why we changed the risk strategy, Chairman, because um, our original risk strategy, everything was in the hot zone. Yes, no, quite. So, so, so we, we, we changed that. So if you recall, it was that top right hand, that top right hand corner of the square, the top, the top, the top, basically the one right in the corner and the three surrounding it, which we call the hot zone. So everything in there has been actively managed. So I, I think the IT score, even if it, even if, I think the IT was already in the hot zone already, so um, I'd have to. Yeah, it, it's, a shame, it's a shame. It's a shame the matrix isn't there. I understand. I was thinking. I had a point on number risk number two: corporate governance and external political environment. So currently, that's a B three. Do you think we're happy in the current climate, where things seem to be changing almost daily? Uh, just remember, this was as at the end of um, yeah, maybe. September, and yes. It's... So that comes up, we've got a significant impact and a medium likelihood. So if we can find, we can, we're sort of looking at the date when this was done, and maybe, I don't know, are we, are, is, that, is that a risk we're happy with in terms of how it's described in terms of B3? Maybe we are. I just thought, you know, the things if on page two hundred four, for instance, there's all the various things that kind of make that that, that risk, and there's a lot of sort of governmental decision and recession and what have you. Maybe we think B three is okay. I just thought that was a question. Yep. Okay. Fine. We've gone. Um, four. Risk number four, which is the staff capacity and skill. Sorry, sorry, Chairman. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, just again, what well, going into the detail in terms of number three, I think part of it is that the triggers are we need to be expanded because there's a lot of it in terms of there's not actually much on performance slash resilience. The triggers are all sort of security. They're not actually triggered by not being able to actually do the work of the council. Council. So I think that potentially needs to be re looked at as well and not just a rescoring on where it is page 207 chairman so there we go sorry there we go sorry cyber attacks in that cyber attacks yeah. in that, in that yes problem, but if you took the triggers on page 207, the incident that happened last week wouldn't have been a trigger to have affected the performance or resilience of the IT systems. I would argue a lack of a system is a performance issue. Yes, I, I, yeah. So is that something we, sh we should add as a bullet in the trigger column? Or, the, or my suggestion would be that the Deputy Chief Executive reviews that particular triggering mitigation measures to make yeah, sure it okay. includes the risks and issues that Council is facing through its IT. Good point. Are you happy with that? Members, are we happy with that? That, that, that they ask the Deputy Chief Executive to, to review the triggers on, on, on this risk? Yep. Okay, good. So, which other bits have we got? Two. Yeah. 
Yes. The triggers, the triggers, the tr triggers within that risk. Yeah, to make sure that they're appropriate. Thank you. Good. Um, I, triggers yeah. and co triggers and consequences. I triggers think. and consequences. The, I, the whole thing, I think. Yeah, we'll go. We'll go through this and at the end. But triggers and consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Star capacity. The next one is staff capacity. Again, that's a B2. I'm happy with that. I, mean, I was just thinking about from, from a staff retention point of view, but I mean, maybe that's not such a big an issue as I thought. Are we happy with B2 on that one? Yeah. And then poor performance or failure of key partner or contractors, which is just number five. Whatever that is. 211. Do we, I mean, there's a bit of, um, in the mitigation, there's a sort of description of, I, mean, I just wondered in the current environment, how likely might it be that a service provider might go bust, go down, have problems, financial, and I think in the mitigation control, it talks about the sort of the, the controls that there are, but I just wondered whether a C, you've got the impact as a C, I just wonder whether, that might be a B, is it whether the impact will be significant if a service provider or a partner went down. Went, went down. I think the, I mean, it's already a four. In terms of the likelihood is. You need to take into good. account, Chairman, that we have contingency plans should contractors fail. So I, I think that's why the impact, um, the impact score is a C because we have contingency, Contin plans, right, contingency plans that we can activate. So if we have no contingency plans, then yes, the impact of it would be A, mm -hmm. but we have contingency plans in place, which is why it's C. So um, the, the score that you get is the score after the mitigations have been yeah, applied. Yeah, but we, we, don't, we don't show the original score and then the score after mitigation, we just sort of show okay. the score after mitigation. So it's, it's a C because of those contingency sure. plans being in place. I can understand that. Sorry, sorry. Just in terms of the four, again, indicates that it's something that like, would happen monthly. Um, have we had any contract failures? I mean, in my memory, since we've had, I can't think of a large scale contract failure that we have had that's impacted the council. I'm just not sure whether it's, again, where the four is necessary. If we, if, if we weighted against some of the other weightings, and, you know, the risk is there, but the actual reality of it happening, is it really monthly? Uh, well, let's see. Last month, the contractor um, employed to do the skate park at um, Castle Park in Bishop Stortford went bust. Um, so there's a contractor who went bust. Now that's not a major supplier. Um, what we what we do, there is a risk every month of a supplier, obviously, of going of going bankrupt. I remember R R Richardson, not R R. Was, was it was that was it Richardson's? Yes, it was R R Richardson's. They were a, they were a housing maintenance contractor, um, for a number of local authorities, and um, they had a, a a statutory demand served on them. And they ignored it, and it was perfectly. It was perfect. The, the company was the company was solvent, etc. But they ignored the statutory demand, so they were actually wound up because they just ignored the statutory demand. So there is a risk of this stuff happening. Um, what we do is we look at this every month systematically to see what what the, the what the market gossip is, because there's often market gossip about companies before they actually reach the tipping point. I mean, we had in my previous council we had Kier as a waste contractor, and apart from the fact that Kier couldn't organize a booze up in the brewery that might collect bins there was a lot going on about the Kia group and potentially going bankrupt and if, if you remember the, the, the chairman of the chairman of Kia made a statement about and, and then the next day they did a share share options thing and his, his share options like halved in value um because he shot himself in the foot about what he said so you, you can get a number of these things occurring Carillion went under etc and now we, we weren't with Carillion but these things you've got to, you've got to be aware of. there's plenty of telegraphing in the market before that happened so what we're doing is we're listening to the market and listening to the gossip and listening who's saying what about who. And bearing in mind the contractors we have, we're then looking at them again and saying, is there, is there a heightened risk? So we're doing that. We do that monthly. And, you know, and, and maybe it only takes 10 minutes because there's no, there's no indications, you know, at all that anything's going on. You, you still can get those, um, those sudden things like, like Richardson's where they simply forgot they have to reply to a statutory demand or you go bankrupt. So you, you can't legislate for those things, but um, 
we do keep them under review so but it's something that you have to do systematically and monthly and you know keeping your keeping your ears to the ground about who's saying what about who so so we do we, we do do it monthly and there is always that there's always a risk i mean it's very it's very difficult to, i mean if i could predict, predict every company that went bust i think that would be a very special art form but you know we can work with the information that we've got I understand. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Uh, again, and I agree, and I, with it, that it's being reviewed monthly, and I think that's prudent. But the waiting is that the likelihood of it happening is that something would, that a contract would fail monthly, not that it's being reviewed monthly. So there is a distinction there. Well, it's both poor performance and failure. But if you look at the the table, how it's weighted, how, the wording of the specific table is that likelihood for high monthly, the event is expected to occur or occurs regularly. So that's why I think just, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with anything you just said. I, 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 th I think, think it's mainly, it's I not think, quite reflective. I of, think it's mainly on the performance side that's happening monthly. And um, for instance, there is a shortage of grounds maintenance crews and grounds maintenance staff. And um, we're our best, uh, still running at very high levels of agency staff. So in terms of performance, because um, it, it's risk of poor performance. Performance, I think we are in 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 penalty payments every month on 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 quite a few of our main contracts. So because and and there's you know performance reviews etc. in in place to to get them back on track. But it's it's just I think it's mainly down to the two. Abasa just can't seem to to recruit staff, and there's there's a heavy agency staff there, and they not knowing the rounds and the properties etc. Bins are being missed, that sort of thing. And in grounds maintenance, which I think. It, just struggling with the crews at the moment, struggling to recruit. So there are, there are. So in in terms of, is the contractual standard being met every month? No, it's not. And I think that's why it's scored monthly, because it's because it's mainly every month we're having those discussions about why have you not met these part these parts of the contract specification. But I think that for there, that likelihood is more around the performance and where we are at the moment in the contract and the fact that they're still struggling to recruit people. So I think I think that's mainly why it's it's, it's a four because it is every month that we're having these performance issues. Do we still think that the um, the diseases risk is still an A4? I mean, certainly in other places, COVID, for instance, related risks are starting to recede a bit. But, I mean, I don't know whether that would be different for a council, but I'm not saying it's still, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be there, but I just wonder whether well, it still needs to be an A4. I think the difficulty is that the, the, the COVID in particular is not yet endemic hmm. and it's still mutating. And we have been fortunate that so far the mutations have not been by being vaccine vaccine evaders. It's still continuing to mutate, and because it's not yet endemic, there is a risk. I mean, uh, the other month, um, I think the number of hospital admissions quadrupled in the course of a month. So it's not as big a risk as it was, mm. but it could still mutate. And until we reach endemic, yeah. endemic, there is still that risk. So. I, th I think colleagues in public health and environmental health are taking the view that they should be cautious right. about relaxing this. It's, it's a good response. Thank you. I think it was worth asking the question. Okay. So that has been a good debate. So the recommendation or the recommendation on page 193, <clears throat> excuse me. So we've got uh, recommendation A, quarter two, quarter two, court risk register reviewed, obviously be advised of any further action that could be taken to manage risk. So we've got two, I think, two points to raise. First of all, that the we think the IT systems risk, which is risk number three, should be an A4 scoring. And also that the um, deputy chief executive should look at that risk across the whole the of that risk, just to make sure that in particular the, 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 the triggers and the, 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 the mitigations to make sure that they're appropriate. Are we happy with, with those? Yeah, so Councillor Nadia, you're happy with that. Thank you. There's a seconder. That's that's for Bell. Thank you. That's for Fernando was a proposal. That's a Bell was a seconder. All those in favour of that? Thank you very much indeed. That's done. So then, then, item eleven: the template to calculate full cost recovery under fees and charges. Policy. And this was the supplementary um, agenda that we received. So, what is this one for you? 
I will hand this over to uh, Mr. Dennis, if I may. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as part of the fees and charges strategy, members will recall that um, the executive did ask that finance came up with a template in order to um, calculate fees under full cost recovery. So this is asking the this committee to endorse it or, re or make recommendations to executive at their meeting in December where they will approve this um, template. So um, this is a bit of pre-scrutiny, if you like, before executive take the decision. So the, the methodology which we have used at first, the first driver of that is an hourly rate for staff time that fully recovers its costs. So we take people's pay costs and um, the first thing we do is there are 13, there are 12 grades in the council starting and grades and grade three, I think it is. And then we, we take we take the top of the salary scale for a start as 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 as, as the costing method. And that accurately, that, that more or less reflects the council. The council has a number of staff who've been here for many, many years. And you know, number the number of people getting 30 year service awards with the council. Um, you know, th th there is a lot of the workforce at the top of the scale. So we always cost at the top of the scale. It doesn't matter then who you get, where they are in the, on that grade, because otherwise we'll, we'll, be, we'll be calculating 325 individual cost rates for individual members of staff, and that way madness lies. Because we couldn't possibly resource that sort of thing. So, so first of all, top of the scale, and, and we, we cost it on the basis of a full-time employee. Now, and that's simply because, once again, we'd have individual rates if, you, if it was the individual rate, because we'd have members of staff who are part time, etc. So it's top of the scale, full time, with and and that they're members of the local government pension scheme, and um, and and we reach that. And that's the pay amount. We then take um, the costs of the council, which are not related to a service. So, for example, the refuse and recycling contract is not included. We don't include bunting for service centre. Um, if we've got postage uh, in, in revs and bends, for example, we know that goes on council tax, NMDR and benefits, so we strip those costs out. So you end up with stuff like um, specific staff training, travel allowances, mileage fees, etc. Um, wall fields we have included because to try and, and try and carve part of this building up, well, for a start with a 50-50 hybrid working, um, we're really running with a, quite, a, quite a large amount of the building spare. Because the desks are still socially distanced from from when um, when COVID started, because we don't want to be move, we don't want to move furniture around the building just yet until we, we're settled on where we're going to move people to 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 concertina them in. So um, to actually strip out which part of this building in particular were, were, were individual um, were, were suitable to go to an individual service, we think is a bit spurious accuracy and a bit too hard to do because. Um, Nobody owns any areas anymore because people are quite literally renting a desk for a day. So, uh, you know, the officer will clear their desk at the end of the day and the next day a different officer will be sat there for half a day and another different officer for the other half a day. So, so we've got that desk rental thing rather than traditional home spaces because we used to divide the building up and finance had X square feet and all the rest of it. It doesn't work like that when you've got a hot desk environment. So actually, and, and the total cost of wall fields, I think, is pound nine pence. On, a, on, a, on an hour, on a charge. So it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. And, and I think to actually go through an exercise of trying to strip out individual cost attributable service in this building is, I think, I think that would be spuriously accurate. So what, what we're trying to do with this is, is, is accurate, but not spuriously accurate and, and doesn't create a huge amount of work in order to calculate it and maintain it. So that's what we've done with the overheads. And then there's corporate democratic core. Now corporate democratic core is, is members. And also um, the corporate democratic core in, in, includes such exciting things as um, external audit fees and um, bank charges and treasury management advisors and, and corporate and what's termed corporate management, which is, 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 what is, is the stuff that heads of service and the chief executive and deputy chief executive do that they would do if they were managing a corporate business effectively. So, you, but you, you also got that democratic representation and management on top as well. So it's a civil classification, but, um, it enables us to say what the hourly cost rate is, what the overhead, what will, plus the overhead cost rate is, and plus corporate and democratic core. And that's important, corporate democratic core, because we did say as part of the fees and charges policy that we will recover the cost of the corporate and democratic core as well. So that's why you've got those elements of, of that. And you can see in Appendix C uh, to the report, um, the grades and the, the numbers that they've added to. Um, and then what we do is we, we work out the chargeable hours. Now, this is a standard, um, a standard calculation that we do. And indeed, um, Simon here has just done this calculation. Science has just done this calculation. And I think we're three days different in, in, how, in, in, in the results of the chargeable days that are available. 
in the on the table on page five, there's a little star after non-chargeable time. I couldn't work out what that meant. Page on asterisk on page five, five of the supplementary. Uh, yeah, the, on the on the spreadsheet that that came from, um, and I should have put it underneath, and it, it's come out as one point seven. So, what what is paragraph one point seven? Should actually have a star on that paragraph. Oh, right. So, I apologise. Yes, it's formatted as one point seven, but it should be a star. So, non chargeable times and allowance for one to ones, PDR, and staff meetings. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yes, so one point seven should have actually been a star. So that, that's how we work out what, what the chargeable hours is. And, and then we, we, we basically divide whatever the cost is by that, by that number of chargeable hours so that you're recovering your, your full cost over chargeable hours. That's a pretty standard calculation. And I think, I can't remember if county was 1467 or you were 1463. But um, certainly the Shared Internal Audit Service and the Shared Anti-Fraud Service have just done a calculation of, of chargeable hours in order to recover hourly costs. And, we're in the same ballpark. Yeah, so that, that's a standard that's a standard calculation that, that audit practices, accountancy firms, mm. solicitors will do to work out their, their hourly rate. And the other thing I've done is once we've once we've calculated is I've rounded it up to the nearest pound. So I can't stand all that pence business. On page 10. You've got the various costs per hour on the on the various grades across the bit the council. I mean, so we start off with sort of thirty three pounds per hour for grade two, going up to eighty three pounds an hour for grade thirteen. And obviously, that would depend on who's doing the work, I suppose. Yeah. So, so um, basically, basically, what what these are used for then is is they go into the template because we ask for yeah. um, if if the staff out, output, you know, the staff time going into things, how long is staff time going into it? But this, but this is designed to fully recover re recover their costs. So, and this will this will be rolled out across the council. Well, sub, sub, subject to it's, subject, yeah. subject to agreement. This is yes. exactly what the fees and charges policy was designed okay. to do. Because I think I think we were basically saying how much is their salary, and then dividing that by, God knows what, how many hours. And this will be, and this, this obviously offers a uniform approach across the council for for, for yeah. the charge. And and and, and obviously, obviously, as you can see in Appendix C, there is um, the hourly rates. Uh, before the corporate democratic core, there's the hourly rate, um, which is pay only. So, so you know, um, depending on if there's any restrictions on things of, of you know not being able to recover certain types of overheads, if it's pure cost or it's or it's a, a sharing arrangement or it's a common arrangement where you just want the staff cost, that's available there as a standard cost. But it's it's been consistently applied across the council because a number I think a number of people would were saying, well, who's the member of staff and oh, they're part time, and you know, so you've got six grade threes all at a different hourly rate, so. It should be the same, right? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I appreciate um, perhaps should have given a bit of an introduction to this in that members will recall that Council last December, we agreed a new fees and charges policy that basically meant that we, we will, uh, going forward, will be charging um, or setting fees and charges to, to um, get full cost recovery. So this is what this mechanism has now been designed to achieve. Thank you. That's, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, thank you. you had. I was going to pause there, Chairman. So, if there are any questions okay. on, on arising at that staff cost, well, I'll pause here and take the question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was just a question on page twelve of the report, where it's in the notes offering concessionary rate, and if you're proposing more than one concessionary rate, etc. What would the uh, what, do you have an idea of what those concessionary rates would be and when they would be offered? I'll get there when I get to that part. I'm, 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 and the staff cost at the, at the okay, first, yeah. first so I'll, I'll address, I will address that point when I get to that, that page of the template. Thank you. So we take those staff rates and then, and then they, 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 they pop into the template and, and the template's designed to start calculating because you can do this on the basis of, of, of are you taking the total cost divided by the total volume? So if you've got, do you take the total cost because you've got 5,000 permits? So you do that. But if you were looking at, particular, you may want to do an activity-based costing process where you work out how many minutes. So we start off with the direct time and you've got the grades there. 
and on the guidance part that there's there's enter the number of minutes to create a decimal you know so that that makes it easier for people so um you, you can say the number of the grade and then and then how much time they're spending and that works out the hourly cost and then you've got indirect staff costs and we do we do and, and we the guidance notes say about support tasks and it's set a standard amount of time if you're raising an invoice because our preference is that that um, payments taken up front and there's no invoice at all and we've got the we know we have the money to do the service so that that's the preference and where we're going to start pressurizing people to people to go to change that no don't invoice it because it's not efficient get them to order it pay for it and then we'll do it so it, but it does set out it sets out a standard time for how long it takes to complete an invoice and it sets out a standard time for the credit control service that central finance will provide and and that's because there are that there are there are a number of people who are quite quick at inputting into the system and there are a number of people who are quite slow at inputting the system and if we and we allowed service areas to just say how long it took a particular person we get variations across the piece whereas um, five minutes per invoice is actually quite an efficient manual process the ideal is that it will of course be interfaced from whatever system we don't have any of those interfaces at the moment we will as a priority when we move to the cloud financials and um, arrange for that interface for trade waste out of the um out of the um, white space system and also part of our savings proposals are to bring our payment processing in house for garden waste which at the moment is handled by a contractor so anyway that, that's the standard rate there that, that, that you should be using for invoicing so ask people to to take that into account and then it moves then down the page into if you've got specific contractor costs where the contractor provides the service so this is to take into account um so stuff like trade waste where a basso would be providing this and, and if you remember at RPZs, it was the air patrol costs from Alcoa, uh, the parking contractor that was going in. So this is where this is this is the way you know where where the contractor provides the service or will provide the service. It's there, and it makes very clear in the guidance that it's for the contractor to tell the officer, not for the officer to tell the contractor. So it makes very very clear there that you're not supposed to tell the contractor well how much you think as the supervising officer or whatever. It's the contractor to tell you how much how long it takes. And then you can then you can say is that right and you know you can have that debate about is that you sure that's right but we don't want officers telling the contractors how long it takes because then you'll end up with officers officers skewing prices so make it very clear that, that comes from the contractor and then you've got other supplies and services costs so for example if we're providing um, um sampling of private water supplies for example there will be consumables there like lab bottles and all the rest of it and lab tests that will be charged for there as part of that as the calculation of the, the true cost of that service in supplies and services area then you've got income from related sales which i'll go back to rpz's again was the sale of uh, visitors vouchers so that comes off um if you've got related income but it has to be related to that service so you then end up with tossing all that up to a full cost and then a net cost taking off that income on the search of services VAT is on the next page ah sorry On page six, we go back that there's a, a volume, you've got a volume options too in terms of. I mean, I that, that's the best. next page. Oh, well. okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'll be quiet. Right. So, um, going over the, going over the page. So, um, the first cat, the first thing it does is calculate a flat rate charge. So, if you've done an activity based costing, the unit of measure is one. In the RPZ example again, we we had the total number of permits. So, and it gives a flat rate cost. And that's your basic flat rate charge where everybody's charged the same. Then you get a variable charge enter, where you're going to enter that first charge manually. Now, if you remember with RPZ, we allowed the first, the first permit at one price. But if you want a second permit, yes, you can have one, but you paid a higher price. And what this variable rate charge does by entering the first charge manually is it allows you to say, okay, so it's an £84 flat rate, but we only want the first permit to be £60 or £70. What it does then is calculate the cost of the second permit by recovering basically that discount or concession that you're offering. So within the totality of that charge, we're still collecting, we're still covering the full cost, but it's just a way of tweaking that charge. So there are occasions with charges where we do, where we do like with RPZ to have the first one is this, but the second one would be more. And that's, that's what that is there to calculate, calculate that sort of variable charge what the fees and charges policy makes absolutely explicit as well is that every charge should have an equalities impact assessment done on it and where the equalities impact assessment suggests there ought to be a concession 
at that point, officers can consider concessions to particular people with protected characteristics, but only when the equality impact assessment suggests it. And then in that case, they will need to speak to finance because then we will take we will give them some advice about what that could potentially be. But there are no hard, fast set rules on what that should be. It, it's what, what the rest of the world are doing and what's appropriate to meet the equality impact assessment. But generally speaking, there will be no concessions or discounts because you happen to live in a rural area or because your parish begins with L or, or anything like that. So generally speaking, there'll be no discounts and concessions. It's only when that equality impact assessment says there's going to be a problem because you're going to be treating people with particular protected characteristic differently that, that the question of concession comes in. Would this become, say for instance, if somebody wanted a, a garden waste bin, it, I don't think, but this, and but but they wanted, that, say for instance, that currently the year, whenever we, 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 we issue bins at a certain time of year and then we pay for them. Currently, if you if you decide suddenly you forgot to, you wanted a bin, you decide you want one, and, you, and then it's halfway through the year, say, and you ask for a bit a, a garden waste bin, you still have to pay the full year for it. Would this situation, this regime cover a situation where somebody wanted to join the garden waste scheme who hadn't joined at the beginning of the year? This came up in the, I was on the group, you know, the working group on the waste contract, and and, and it, one or two residents have contacted me, I don't know if anyone else has had that, whereby either they forget to renew or they're not, not or, they, or they decide they want to join it. And and, and they, they were hoping that they, the, the cost of it would be prorated rather than the full year but currently it's the full year so if you if you join at the beginning of the year it's what it is 40 quid or whatever it is, 80 quid. and then but if you join in halfway through it it's still the same you have to pay that well this are you saying that that still we still wouldn't be able to offer the residents an opportunity to pay a prorated amount for their waste bin if, even if they join halfway through the year or if you've, if you've got a property councillor where they've not been a member before and we have to deliver a bin to them, then £40 per, is, is a reasonable contribution towards the delivery of the bin. Yeah. So, and, and, and I think that's what, what that pricing structure is trying to capture is, is, is the assumption that if you don't pay, um, you know, your bin won't get collected. And, you know, if you ask for us to take it away, we'll take it away. Otherwise, we just leave it because mm. um, it's not really economic to collect them back in to be honest from every property but we have we have collected some back in to prevent antisocial behavior but i mean i wasn't that close to when the garden how the garden waste charge was actually established in the terms and conditions so the terms and conditions are, are standard across both ourselves and north hearts but i i, I think that the fact it's, it's the same price per year is to reflect the fact that you get bin deliveries and stuff like that and also that if you try to make direct debit changes with abasa it costs money yeah quite a lot of money to make a direct debit change. So if you've got a variable rate and you've got a low rate in the first year, you then have to pay a charge to put the rate back up to the full rate. And a basin will charge every time you make that, every time you make a change. So it's actually probably, it works out cheaper for the customer and cheaper for us, because obviously those increased costs for those M direct debit changes will have to go back into the price base. Yeah, for sure. Which is part of the reason we want to bring it, bring it in house. And perhaps with bringing it in house, we'll be able to offer um, pro rata rates. Yeah. But I think I think the well, as I say the principal driver I think is the assumption that it'll be a new property and therefore the bins will need delivering yeah. and also taking into account I think a bass charge charged twelve pounds for every direct debit change. Wow, you're right, sure. Thank you. So the last thing we want to do is um, you know, encourage that, encourage that, no, and encourage that sort of change, and 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 also, councillor, I think that's why we're keeping the the garden waste charge the same as last year as well because yeah. um, any income that we raise from a change would be probably wiped out by the direct debit charge direct debit change charges which is why it, it, i'm anxious to bring direct debits online as quickly as possible yeah and um, obviously north hearts i guess will be bringing their their garden waste change into line event um as part of a part of the next contract there is the intention for north hearts to, to raise to, their, har their, to harmonize it. to harmonize the charges yeah. because i mean we've, we've significantly raised um trade waste charges during during the course of this contract to harmonize them with north hearts mm and to change our terms and conditions in line with North Hearts as well. Mm. So um, yeah, yes, as part of that, we are expecting North Hearts will have to move their garden waste charge up to harmonize as part of the next contract. Mm. Okay, thank you. So that's what that concession is. And then you've got to get the volume price options. And um, I've included in the paragraph of the report, 
uh, an example of where it does that. So, and that's just an example that I've made up. So the costs are made up and the container sizes are made up, but it just gives you an example of, of, of how it would calculate uh, the price of certain literage containers. Mm. And so it just gives you that example of how it would do that. So if you've got, you know, 60,000, 6,000 M60 litres and 4, 20, 240 litres, it will work out that price. And that, that is, is to help in those particular cases where you've got um, that volume sort of thing. And it does particularly lend itself to trade waste bins, et cetera. Mm. And our prices, we um, always use, the prices here are, are, are before VAT, so right. not inclusive of VAT, which is why it does say specifically on... Um, page 12 of the supplement and um, prices calculated are excluding that and that if it doesn't if you're you've got a price of inclusive VAT in the fees and charges book and um, to speak to your business support your business and uh, your business partner and they will either amend the book or or you need to have the book changed to this price plus VAT we tend to quote VAT inclusive prices in the fees and charges book where it's public facing where um for domestic customers because basically your average punter in the street who lives in a house where buying a service wants to know what the cost is and they don't care about the VAT. But when you've got business customers, they obviously care about the VAT because many can claim the input tax back. So it, it, it's, it's horses for courses. So we will do VAT inclusive prices where it's mainly domestic, domestic facing customers because that's what they expect. They expect to know what they're paying. They want to know what they're going to have to pay. They don't want to know it's plus VAT. So, but generally speaking, this model will calculate this before VAT. And then appendix B was just was just an example, and I just used the information from the RPZ calculations the year before, just to just to bring the uh, the sort of um, the template to life, really. Do you need a proposal to endorse the template, or is it just an open? Uh, Under the fees and charges policy, and make it and or make any recommendations. I don't think we've got any. I don't think there are any recommendations. I think we've listened to your explanation of the papers, which we all read, and I didn't have any. I didn't have any points to raise. Okay, so we'll, we'll look. We'll, the recommendation will be to endorse the template, then I think. And we haven't got any recommendations to make. So Councillor Fernando was proposing Councillor Bockney was seconding. All those in favour? Smashing. Thank you very much indeed for that. That was a useful, useful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So the last item is the work programme. Which is on page 226. So so, um, I note, I don't, Steve, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. I noticed we've got some cyber training. Uh, well, first of, all, first of all, Chairman, I, I, I put a subcommittee on for December, January, just in, no. case, just in case we managed to get the accounts here. Yes, I, I should have, forgive me, I should have mentioned um, for the purpose of the meeting. We're still no further, really. Well, there's, there's been some movement, but we're, 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 not, we're not in the final stage yet. No. But, um, I'm hoping to get there, which is why I, I put a subcommittee in, because if we can get rid of this, let's get rid of it. But we're looking, when we considering doing this last Christmas. Yes, Jim. We were thinking about a Christmas Day meeting, weren't we? I think it was probably Boxing Day. Bar one. That. That's a thunder, sorry. Uh, thank you. Just to touch on the, your point, Jim, about cybersecurity, I'm just wondering, given its closeness to elections next year, you'd probably have to repeat that training given that you may have any, whatever happens, there may be some changes, and therefore, is it, and that may actually be something that the entire council should, under, the entire councillor should undertake rather than something specific. So I'm just wondering whether it's the best timing for that training, given that councillors, etc., we've had our own independent cyber security train, you know, programme that we had to do. Um, this is some more from a risk management perspective. Simon, were you going to have some evolved? Forgive I'm me. Just thinking, I'm just thinking, given the timings of, uh, it feels like something you'd have to repeat. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Tom, do you have any uh, comment to make on this at all? 
Yeah, thank you, Chairman. My, my recollection was that members of this committee were looking for assurance around the Council's cybersecurity control framework and that the committee was minded to invite a member of uh, staff from the shared IT service to explain a little about that. Yeah, exactly. I think it would be, I think that's okay. Sorry. No, no, uh, again, it's just if anything comes from that, I'm not sure that there may necessarily be time to implement. Any of us will be here. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just saying it's just given how important it is and given that we've just, you know, proposed that we re-look at the, reg the risk and we've identified that as one of our key risks, uh, either we should try to bring, pull it forward would be my uh, suggestion. Or again, it looks at that it's done again in May, but I'm not. I just don't, it it feels awkward having it on the 28th of March. Is just my view. I think you're right. That'll be after the elections. I I quite like to have it. But well, some as we you know, amongst us amongst us 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 who are here. Simon, sorry, do you want to say? I was just going to say something unhelpful, really. It depends. It, it, it depends. It depends what it is that members are looking for. I, I don't think it was particularly a process of educating all members at a full council meeting, if that's what you were suggesting. I think you summarise. Yeah. Okay. And I think I don't think it would be a bad the end of the world if it was where it was, but I don't have a strong. I think it. Did that we as a group asked for this item, and I think it would be useful for us as a group to deal with it. The fact that it's in March, I don't think that's a, it's just another item for us to look at and get ourselves comfortable with, and it'll be minuted. And so we, we probably look at the minutes after. But we'll be able to gain what they need to from those, I would, I would suggest. If people feel strongly, then I'm happy to go along with it. But I, I don't think having it in March will be the end of the world, personally. Do you, do you think, do, would you agree with that, someone, or not? I, mean, maybe. I think it would be appropriate it was as it was members of this committee that was looking for that assurance. No, I think we can do that. Personally. Yes, people others and others feel strongly about it. Mr. Chairman, at that March meeting you do have the um the Jan January is a very busy meeting with the with the budget. So um and in March you do have the um it's the last meeting of the committee before Simon then produces the the annual assurance statement from the Australian Internal Audit Service. So, if members are going to understand the, the assurance statement, then they should have an understanding of the cyber the cyber risk if they particularly raise that point. My my, my problem is that the, the May meeting obviously um, we would have had an election by then, and there are potentially. I mean, I can't tell how many councillors will return to the committee without experience of the committee or not. So, the first training session on that May one was the role of the Audit and Governance Committee. Because I'm anticipating a certain churn, churn in members, because that's always happens. Elections, members stand aside. Events occur. So um, that, that, yep. that 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 May meeting, the first training event on there, I was proposing was the role of the committee, yep. so they could fully understand where they they sit within the corporate governance of the council, etc. So I think we should leave it in March. I think it'll be all right to do that. I think so. It's particularly strong. It was just a comment. No, no, it's fair. It's a fair. It's a fair comment. Other than that, I don't think there was any. Uh, were there any, um, Stephen? Do you have any comments on this? I think it was. Um, I, I, I put the cybersecurity training request today. Um, the first training on on the May cycle will be the role of the audit and governance committee, and then um, then the training at the September committee. Oh, I am such an optimist. This fact, the same with accounts. Um, those will be the twenty one, twenty two accounts. By the way, if I was wondering about which, track, year which financial year. Um, and then and then um, we have. Um, Quite a busy meeting there. And then the 29th of November, I was going to do treasury management on the assumption that many members of the committee will be new to treasury management as well. And then obviously January, we don't I don't tend to do training and it's not on there yet because it will stop there. And if members haven't noticed yet, the committee used to have five meetings and it's been down to four. Audit plans. I mean, I don't know. Did we, we... Audit audit plans um for um both the fraud and shared anti-fraud service and the shared internal audit service. Are down for. Well, I was thinking more about external audit plans. 
Oh, oh Councillor Pope, you're asking me to read. I, I have no idea what no. EY are going to do, Councillor uh, Council Pope. Mm. And, and if assets audit services are confirmed as our external orders from 2023 onwards, I've never heard of them. I assume they're Scottish. But... So, I, I, I mean, I did start trying to put it, put it in and then I just realised I'm, I'm just pure guesswork and I didn't want to clutter it up. Yes, they need to be added, but I need yeah. some clarity sure. from external order of, of when their resourcing backlogs and problems are going to get sorted if, or if they're not going to get sorted. We run the serious risk of having the 22, 23 accounts coming here after the 23, 24 accounts have been signed off. Yeah. So I've, 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 so what, what I've done is I've, I've tried to try to fit in what I know is likely to happen onto the plan with with one meeting less per year, and then um, I'll deal with the external audit stuff when I get some sort of confidence that if an internal audit say something to me that that's actually what they mean when they're going to deliver it, because if you remember we were told they're going to have the accounts finished by May. Yeah. So I, I don't want to put any of their stuff in here. I have got it in the back of my head. And, I, and if members wanted, I could put it in a separate box underneath going TBA uh, of all of all the external audit stuff. That sounds, yeah, that sounds like And do that if you like, but, yeah. um, it, it, but it's, it's the committee's work program for us, so it's for the committee to say. So in terms of training, so May you said was going to be the role of the committee. Did you say? I was suggesting that simply because after an election you expect a a number of new yeah, members come along and, and if they don't, if, 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 it's just taking them what the role of the committee is you know and um, from the council's constitution where they fit within the account of all the regulations etc cetera, etc cetera. so they and, and you know a little bit on the role of internal audit and fraud etc yeah that, that, so i think we should certainly agree we're happy with that that that, that, that 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 sort of item of training should be for the may meeting i think we would agree with that we'll agree with that, with that with that in the minutes um so then we could, we've got a bit of a gap then we can go from may to september then that reflects the yes Jeremy. if you remember the original accounts and audit regulations had assumed that we had a draft statement of accounts issued by the end of may and that the external auditors would all have finished their external audits and you would be sitting in july to approve accounts well they've changed the accounts and audit regulations now to say um draft accounts by the end of may and um you'll sit at the end of september and approve the accounts mm. that's what the accounts and audit regulations will say so i've adjusted the meetings to reflect that cycle right and it just means that some meetings will be a little busier, a little bit more on the agenda. Okay. So we've got two lots of training on statement of accounts, one nominally, one in December and one in September, but there'll be different sets different, of people. Different councils, potentially. Yeah, different, yeah, that's fine. And then... And, and as, as, as you you know, Chairman, from, from many years as Chairman, local authority accounts are pretty opaque at the best of time. Yeah, well, that's true. And we've got Treasury Management in November. Which is a good, a good yeah, because that's when I expect in, in the cycle most of the Treasury management reports will come. So we'll have that link in to um, once again go and run through the Treasury stuff and so that members understand their role. Okay. Then, so as far and then as I'll, rail, I'll, I'll, I'll roll the stars of the show out, you know, Nick and um, Simon out in, 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 the next, in the next set of cycles. Okay, so we, thank you. So we've, we've got cybersecurity in March and we've, we've agreed that we'll add um, the role of the committee in may which is with a new committee at that point so that'd be useful for new members with it or whatever they are at that point uh, together with uh profit and loss and the uh, balance sheet presented at uh, probably january because that needs to be done at the same time as the budget so we Discuss this earlier. Did we? Did we agreed. I think Stephen. Did were you going to talk to Democratic Services about this? Michelle and I will have a discussion with the monitoring officer about what can and can what what was was a suitable scoping for this. I will. I will. I will work with the monitoring officer to make sure the members get as much information as possible. Will you? Would you come back by email to the to, to the members of the committee on on the, this point? I'm, I'm, I'm sure Michelle will. Or, be all right. Communicate back by you. Before the next meeting, anyway, certainly. As possible, we want a balance sheet and we need a profit and loss account. We need to see what is going on. You, uh, Stephen's going to discuss. I, 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 I just want to make sure that members yeah. aren't seen as acting as shadow directors. I, 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 yeah. I, I just. But, but, but we. They leave that with Stephen then, he'll come back and we'll make sure that, that his response is 
what we're looking for. So I think I think Stephen understands what we need or what would like. Fine, we'll leave that with you. Okay, that's okay for the purposes of the minutes. Changes in terms of the essentially the training we've got like, sort of noting cyber training, we're adding um, training for new members of or, or the role of the committee in May, and the possible addition of the items that Council Crofton discussed in with regard to Mill Street. They would they may be potential changes to the work program. Other than that, we're happy to endorse it. Um, Councillor Fernando, Councillor Crofton, all those in favour? Now we're noting, we are need to note that um, the, um, where were we? It was, it was the um, anti-fraud item seven. Uh, clearly, Mr. J, I, hope, I haven't heard anything from Nick. I hope he's okay. everything's okay. You've not heard anything further, I guess. Oh, I was just going to suggest that after the meeting that someone like Nick could not be here, so just check in and make sure he is okay. No. Yeah. yeah. Are we happy to no. note the report? What's the recommendation? Yeah, the, um, Okay, we're just to, we have just to, to yes. as, as Councillor Crofton mentioned, we've read it. We're happy to note it. Okay, we'll do that. And yes, please. Yeah, that would be great. <coughs> okay, in which case, I think there's no urgent business, I believe. <coughs> Thank you. That's a meeting finished. <coughs>